welcome to all of you and thank you for showing up on this cold March day. Uh, but at least we were spared a snowstorm. That was sort of my nightmare. We'll have a blizzard just as you know, flights are supposed to be landing. So, so far, so good. Um, Blair has covered some of the essentials, but let me um, say a couple of things. So, bottom-up politics. How did such a notion come about? As a general idea, it's hardly new, but there is, I think, fresh energy around it. Uh, disenchantment with top-down is one source, and this precedes the Trump presidency, though there is some tendency, I think, to assume that the Trump presidency is like, you know, an absolute marker in time, you know. We have BT before Trump and AT after Trump. Um, so its origins go back. And the feeling that top down is not necessarily the answer to everything is something that can be traced back, uh, certainly, into the 20th century. Um, so as uh, Blair alluded to, a few, a few years back, following a session on neighborhood politics, a small group of local scholars began a discussion of the difficulties that would be faced by President Hillary Clinton. <laughs> so after re recovering from that misguided start, we returned to Earth to consider the many ways that top-down politics had become a path to disappointment. So we sought to reverse the thinking about top-down. And so we came up with a three-part model. One, begin with the local level as a source of initiative and political energy. Two, posit a pragmatic problem-solving orientation as a central feature. Three, highlight connections that cut across the usual divides by party, sector, affinity grouping, and various demographic identities. As New York Times uh, sage uh, David Brooks and sundry others were speaking of a localist revolution, we sought and received reassurance of its reality. Uh, we're not saying a completed revolution, just uh, an incipient one, maybe. Um, and so here at the Wilson Center, as Blair said, we had a predecessor symposium a year ago we had three grassroots voices that talked about bottom-up from their perspective and their experience. Now, uh, they did remind us that effective bottom-up is often interwoven, interwoven in important ways with the nation's intergovernmental system. So when we talk about bottom up and what's going on, we do not see that as something that is in isolation from the larger intergovernmental system. So today, the question is, what can bottom up deliver? What challenges does it face? What are its limitations? Now, to be sure, not everything that happens locally responds to the needs of the underserved. In fact, that concern is one of the things that sort of pulled us in this direction. Some of what is taking place is far from meritorious. So we're not claiming that, you know, bottom-up is the new 
uh, utopia that has uh, come to be. So, <clears throat> but there are, you know, uh, a, a, a number of things to take into account. Uh, Top-down, of course, has by no means disappeared. The political scene continues to evolve. It seems almost daily that it evolves. Um, and so we have things like collective bargaining faces stubborn obstacles. But teachers' organizations especially have displayed new strength. The book, Our Towns, uh, reports a widespread phenomenon its authors call local patriotism. Local patriotism. A mindset that bypasses the anger and antagonisms of national politics. Yet and still, how much can it encompass? So if there is this sort of healthy local activity, how much does it actually encompass? How far does local patriotism reach? And what about the other things that are occurring locally? So, uh, in pursuing change, it seems to me there is a delicate balance between consensus building and advocacy. And so a question is, is there a sweet spot between the two? And if so, please tell us about it, identify it. <laughs> and a question, an important question, I think, is what might the academic community contribute at this time? Uh, in short, where might we go from here? So, faced with these questions, we decided to assemble a panel of the nation's most distinguished minds to help us sort through this and to begin to think about that. So, a special <coughs> thank you to the panelists for coming together and talking with us. And so I'm going to now pass the baton to my distinguished colleague here at the center of the <laughs> So thank you Clarence. Thank you. <laughs> Clarence has set the stage for what we've been uh, working on for a good year and a half now uh, together on a regular basis with Blair and Allison and um, occasionally Derek by uh, cyberspace. <laughs> and um, we, uh, and, and last summer I presented some of these ideas in Europe, which was actually very interesting to get a European perspective on uh, local grassroots uh, activities in places where the states are much more centralized, usually more centralized. So um, today we have four very distinguished speakers and um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them but that is my job so please try to talk for 15 minutes and I'll be the timekeeper, okay? Um, the, uh, our, I think I'll just introduce you all together so that I won't interrupt. Um, our first speaker will be Manuel Pastor who is Distinguished Professor of Sociology and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He's Distinguished Professor there and um, currently directs a program on environmental and regional equity. How do you pronounce it? Peary? Peer. Peer. Peer? Uh, and the Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration. He's also can't say this, Terpangian, is that right? Professor, uh, Chair in Civil Society and Social Change at USC, and he has an economics degree from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Um, 
Professor Pastor's research generally focused on issues of economic, environmental, and social conditions in low-income urban communities and social movements that seek to change those realities. Um, he has more books than my bookshelf, I mean, a lot of books, uh, but his most recent one uh, is the one that really caught our eye as a great cover, too, called State of uh, Resistance, What California's Dizzying Descent and Remarkable Resurgence Means for America's Future. Uh, it just came out from New Press last year, and uh, it, it um, describes many of the local initiatives in Los Angeles and elsewhere in California. It really does cover the entire state in many ways um, and shows how um, localism can actually um, form a opposition to federal coercion, let's say. Uh, he also served as a public member of the Strategic Growth Council in California, member of the Commission on Regions, um, by, uh, appointed by the California Speaker, and uh, is a member of the Regional Targets Advisory Committee for the California Air Resources Board. He received a Liberty Foundation's Wally Marks Changemaker of the Year Award, as well for his social justice research partnerships. Our second speaker is Theda Scotchpaul, who's the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard. She um, has also served as Dean of the Graduate School and Director of the Center of Amer for American Political Studies. Uh, she's an internationally recognized scholar. She's in every one of these honor societies and probably more. She, okay, I won't read them all. Um, uh, and. She serves as the director of the Scholar Strategy Network, which is really what attracted us to you. <laughs> it's an organization with dozens of regional chapters that encourages nonpartisan public engagement by university-based uh, scholars, building ties between academics and policymakers, civic groups, and journalists. Her work carry, covers a broad spectrum of topics, um, and she's had every award and has been president of everything, so I won't read all those. Um, but, but, you know, she's, she's most recently, she has diminished democracy from membership to management in American civic life. Um, her, her analysis of healthcare reform in America was, t was, was terrific. And um, what she's working on now is clearly a counterpoint to her book on the Tea Party and the remaking of Republican conservatism. Uh, she speaks regularly to the community groups. She just told me that she's out in the field talking to these women's groups that you'll hear about today. Um, and unlike the fallows, she does not travel by private plane. Um, <laughs> third, William E. Spriggs is professor of economics at Howard University and he's chief economist of the AFL-CIO. Uh, in his role, he chairs the Economic Policy Working Group of the Trade Union Advisory Committee of the OECD. He serves on the board of the NBER, and he formerly served as Assistant Secretary for the Office of Policy in the U.S. Department of Labor during the first uh, Obama years. So this is somebody who has a lot of experience in at the federal level, um, and his perspectives on employment and other aspects of uh, federal policy will be very uh, valuable to us uh, in our, in our uh, discussion today. Our fourth speaker is Margaret Ware, who is Wilson Professor of International and Public Affairs at, uh, and Political Science <laughs> at Brown University. She arrived just as I was leaving. Um, she she uh, taught for many years before Brown at the University of California, Berkeley, where she held the uh, Avis Saint Chair in Public Policy. She is the author and editor also of several books and most recently co-authored Rebuilding Resilient Regions. Um, and uh, she spent many years at Brookings as well, so she's no stranger to the Washington scene, but she has been working for many years on metropolitan regions and how they can develop as regions the capacity to bounce back from economic and demographic shocks. So um, with that said, now you know who you're going to hear from. I'm just going to go down the, down the, ro down the row. Fifteen minutes, I'll set my timer. Um, shall we begin with um, Professor Pastor? 
Thank you, and very glad to be here. You're right, except for the weather. This is not conducive to a Californian visiting the East Coast. Um, we were asked to address a series of questions. Can local government provide a dependable anchor? Uh, what's the articulation with state and federal strategies? To what extent does race have explicit priority in organizing? What about civic collaboration and the role of organized labor? What can we learn from recent teacher strikes? What role can scholars play? Aside from those questions, we were asked to comment on the negotiations with North Korea about the <laughs> nuclear, uh, and also to speculate on what will eventually be in the Mueller report as it comes out. Uh, that's, that's a lot to address, uh, so I'll try to address at least a little bit of that by telling a little bit of the California story. Um, and I, uh, th as was mentioned, just finished, uh, came out last year, a book called uh, State of Resistance. Um, it actually builds on quite a bit of work having looked at metropolitan and local organizing, including with the business community. Uh, there's an earlier book called Equity, Growth, and Community that looks specifically at this in the formation of epistemic or knowledge communities at a regional level. However, it's not my most recent book, and you can download that book for free. So I'm going to talk about the book you'd have to pay for, uh, then tantalize you to buy it. Uh, so with a title like uh, State of Resistance, What California's Dizzying Descent and Remarkable Resurgence Mean for America's Future, you might think that it was a book perhaps prompted by an election. Uh, and you'd be right, except it was actually prompted by the 2008 election of Barack Obama. Because one of the things that I noticed after Obama got elected was that a lot of people who were progressive or liberal was a little bit like planning for Hillary to win. They sort of bum-rushed Washington, thinking that change would happen in Washington, rather than going back to do the organizing in local communities that would either provide win to Obama's sales when he was right, or hold him accountable when he was wrong. And into that relative vacuum of community, or a lack of community organizing, there was some going on, stepped in the Tea Party, something that Data has written quite a bit about, and actually sort of picked up on local anger um, about what was going on in a federal level. It might have been astroturfed in by Koch Brothers dollars, but it was actually speaking to some really legitimate anger that was out there at a local level. So before the November 2016 election, I was determined to write a book about California and the local organizing that took place to change California, uh, and had, was thinking, like many folks, that Clinton would win, and that what would happen would be that people who were on the left or liberal side of the equation would make exactly the same mistake, thinking that change happens through policy at a federal level rather than providing coalitions at a local, metropolitan, and state level. And then, of course, the election turned out a very different way. So the day after the election, I walked in to my office. I run a research center. It's got a lot, about 18 people working for it, a lot of young staff. They were pretty shocked by the outcome and a little bit devastated. I was there, expected to inspire them and, and cheer them up, and I said, here are my inspiring words, I think it's going to be worse than you think. Uh, <laughs> and I think I was right. Uh, this is one of the few times when an economist has made an accurate prediction. Uh, but what I realized was that, in some sense, America had just gone through its Prop 187 moment, the sort of anxiety around undocumented immigration and immigrants and demographic change that drove California in the early 1990s to pass a proposition denying services to undocumented uh, immigrants, including educational services to undocumented immigrant children. But what people forget about California was it wasn't just immigrant anxiety. In the early 1990s, half of the country's net job losses occurred in California because that recession was driven by the end of the Cold War, the cuts in defense spending that basically really hit our aerospace industry hard and that sort of toppled out the legs from what was the remaining linkage of our industrial structure. So we suffered half of the country's job losses and people often forget, too, that Rush Limbaugh began his talk radio career in the late 1980s in Sacramento. So this kind of perfect combination of demographic anxiety, economic uncertainty, and profiteering from political polarization, we did it first in the Golden State. So the question is, at least I think, how did things turn around? How did localism play a role for this particular conversation such that 
California is now um, a state leading on climate change, one of the first two states to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, a state that declared itself a sanctuary state with a piece of legislation called the California Values Act. That's a pretty significant uh, narrative statement about that. How did all of that uh, turn around and what role did uh, localism play? So what I want to... Uh, the book is really good and goes into this in great detail. It's a very short talk. So what I want to do is to lift up a couple of things that I think really did make a difference in the arc from the 1990s to current day California. It's important for people to remember California gave you uh, Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. California gave you the anti-tax fervor of Prop 13 that led to the tax cutting at a federal level. This was a reliably red state. And now it is a state where Orange County, in this last election, every single congressperson elected out of there is Democrat. And that is the first time that's happened since the dawn of man. So <laughs> very, very big change. So what happened? I want to suggest a couple things happened. One was that we were going through a lot of demographic shifts that were unsettling. But those demographic shifts both slowed down, and they helped to slowly change the electorate, uh, and also to make the white electorate more comfortable with the diversity that was coming to their suburbs and their localities, and that kind of one-on-one -on -one contact made a difference. The second thing that I think really made a difference was the shifting economy in California between the 1990s and the current period. And it had two aspects to it, actually three. One was that uh, it gave rise, the shift in the economy, to a big group of working poor. And one of the impacts of that, because of the deindustrialization, people losing those sort of middle wage jobs, big influx of immigrants, big growth in the working poor, created a lot of political sympathies for anti-poverty policies. We are not in the United States sympathetic to people who are poor but not working. We are very sympathetic to people who are poor but at work uh, and working full time. So it changed the politics of it. Second thing on the economic side that make it made a difference was the uh, kicking out of air, the, the shredding of aerospace and the collapse of industry in Southern California weakened a relatively conservative business class in Southern California, just as a more liberal business class in Northern California was on the rise with high tech. A business class that was quite libertarian in terms of its view around markets, but was open to diversity, immigration, and environmental protection that is open to a very different kind of politics. Third thing that was happening economically was the rise of regions. This was an era in which regions were rising as the economic unit, perhaps no place more than in California, with Silicon Valley taking off in a very different way than a Fresno or Los Angeles or San Diego. And in California, there emerged a set of localist, regional collaboratives. And those regional collaboratives were business, civic collaboratives that at least uh, in terms of narrative said that they wanted to focus in on the economy, the environment, and equity. That narrative shift and that regional organizing created the opportunity for people to meet face to face, race to race, place to place at a local or metropolitan level around a narrative frame that said equity was important. It was really the weakest of the three legs in those regional collaboratives, but it was an open political space. One big political shift, and then I'll talk about the organizing, which is what the book is primarily about. Um, the, uh, the big political shift in California was term limits. Term limits, which were something that most people who were liberal had resisted, or associated with the Democratic Party had resisted, uh, actually wound up opening up the space for lots of new people to come into the formal government structure. So for example, Karen Bass, who's now the head of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, was a community organizer in South LA who ran for the state assembly and because of term limits became the first within three years African American female head of a state assembly anywhere in the United States. And the president pro tem of the Senate, Kevin DeLeon, who presided over the increase in the minimum wage, uh, the California Values Act, et cetera, cut his teeth as an organizer against Prop 187 when he was young. But when he ran for office, he could move quite quickly to the top because of term limits. 
What the book focuses in on, though, is a remarkable shift in community organizing at a local level, which helped to really make a difference. And I'll say a couple things about that. And I have, is it about five minutes that I've got? Yes, you do. Um, so a couple things about that that I think are really um, significant. I'll just lift up uh, five in the five minutes. Um, so first, um, there was a remarkable rethinking on the part of progressive political organizers and actors uh, in the following way. People uh, who generally are on the left are often quite used to losing, and losing like with great integrity and pride that they lost. Right, like we, we really stuck with our values and we lost. And what people began to realize is that when you're losing in an atmosphere in which immigrants are on the attack, affirmative action is being eliminated, over incarceration is taking place, it's very costly to lose. And that led to a shift in the engagement with electoral politics and gave birth to what we in California, and you've seen a little bit of it in the 2018 midterm elections call uh, integrated voter engagement. Integrated voter engagement is not the traditional get out the vote at the end and touch the people that you know are already going to vote. Integrated voter engagement is doing, it's basically community organizing meets electoral politics, and it's about forming relationships well before elections, and then also using elections as an excuse to say you've already been engaged in civic life, why don't you now come to a protest or a board meeting or a council meeting to sort of thicken the civic life through community organizing. California now does integrated voter engagement on a scale such that 750,000 new and occasional voters, the kind of voters that tipped the scale in Texas, or nearly tipped the scale in Texas or in Georgia in the last election, have that, that people in California have gotten practice at doing that. That's being driven by community-based uh, organizing. Uh, second thing um, is that it's much more intersectional organizing. So the organizing has been much more about not just doing immigrant rights, but connecting that with economic justice issues, connecting that with the incarceration issues, et cetera, uh, doing intersectoral organizing. Most significant thing about that has been the merger of immigrant organizing and labor organizing, particularly emerging out of Los Angeles. Uh, two other things, and then the big thing that will be the close here, that's the most relevant to today. One is challenging race and racism. One of the things I think that people on a national level think is that if we didn't talk about race, it might not pop up as an issue in your politics. But it was very clear in California that right when we needed to focus our attention on a restructuring economy, racism got the better of us. Our voters began voting for blaming immigrants over incarceration instead of thinking about what needed to happen to the economy. and that. I think at least has some resonance on a national level. So beginning to put race and racism into the conversation. Uh, getting much more sophisticated about inside-outside politics. Uh, that is running community-based people for political office and also realizing that people who are in political office are not going to save you. They're not going to save you unless you've changed the calculus of politics at a grassroots level underneath them so that it actually makes it uh, politically palatable for them to take those actions that they take. So, for example, uh, you know, the, all the stuff that's happened around uh, the, the minimum wage increase in California, which is pretty dramatic, was actually resisted by the governor, and he actually negotiated a much slower path to that minimum wage. The California Values Act, uh, sanctuary state, was resisted by the governor, but the political calculus underneath it had changed. So what's the inside-outside strategy? The final thing I'll say is that it really was part of a sophisticated, um, and this gets to the question of networks of localities, a very sophisticated geographic strategy. People who are progressive in California realize something very fundamental. You are not going to get one more liberal vote out of Berkeley. If there is a conservative person living in Berkeley, that person is determined, right? They're resisting all of the cultural norms around them, right? Where you're going to change the state politically is in San Diego, in Orange County, in the Inland Empire, and in the Central Valley. So people began to figure out what does it take to build community-based organizations in those localities and tie them with anchor organizations that existed in Los Angeles and the Bay Area. So to me, that really fits into the theme of today because a lot of it was about localist organizing first in communities, 
then bubbling up to a regional level at the region of Los Angeles and the region of the Bay Area, groups like Lane that you mentioned, Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, groups like the Social Equity Caucus and Urban Habitat and Working Partnerships in the Bay Area, but they realized they could not move the state unless they began to create analog organizations and support them in other parts of the state. So it's not just a localist thing, it's how do you build it up to a metropolitan level, and then how do you network those localist efforts so they can actually have an impact in the state terrain, and if one is to think about the federal government on the federal terrain. And that is the book in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. It really is a summary of the book in 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to now uh, hear from Professor Scotchpaul. Dita. Dita. Yeah. <laughs> now I got to get this thing working where we want to. Okay. There we go. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, two widespread, voluntarily organized, electorally sparked outrage movements okay. that happened in the United States at what is an unusual conjuncture, but young people wouldn't know it, which is a president, controversial president, elected in Washington with both houses of Congress from the same party. Um, that, it, that happened in 2008 with Barack Obama from the point of view of conservative-minded people in this country, and it happened, uh, I think, as most people in this room probably know, in a shocking way uh, in, in November of 2016. And um, let me, I'd just like you to take a look at these quotes uh, from um, a husband and wife operating in 2009, who organized a local tea party in Arizona, and a woman age 55, these are typical demographics, who organized a resistance group against Trump at the grassroots in Wisconsin uh, eight years later. And, you know, the left liberal is a little more wordy about it, <laughs> but um, <laughs> they're really saying exactly the same thing, which is I woke up and realized that just voting wasn't enough, um, uh, my country was being taken away from me, and if I didn't get going and connect to other people, uh, doom, you know, basically. Uh, so um, I want to talk a little bit today about some findings from some new work that my colleagues and I are doing on the grassroots resistance, not the national leaders who appear on MSNBC, but the grassroots people who are organizing. Um, it draws on several, what I'm going to say here quickly, uh, f draws from several kinds of research. One is um, visits that I'm making as a political scientist to eight pro-Trump counties, two apiece in North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, where I try to talk to liberals, conservatives, um, civic leaders, religious leaders. Um, and that, on those first visits in the spring of 2017, I discovered that even in these very conservative places, there were grassroots uh, voluntary anti-Trump groups that had been formed and were beginning to meet regularly. There are still two Tea Parties uh, in meeting in, in, in two of the eight counties as well, and that's a, a long time after virtually all of them had one or more Tea Parties uh, eight years before. Uh, we've also teamed up with Pennsylvania Together, which is one of the coordinating bodies that has, uh, that pulls together a lot of the local resistance groups to have two waves of questionnaires um, filled out by leaders of groups across the state of Pennsylvania. That's important because it means that we're cross-checking against a broader range of data that comes from the Pittsburgh and Philadelphia suburbs, not just from the, these non-metropolitan, more conservative places. Uh, and then, of course, I, I'm able to make comparisons to the work that Vanessa Williamson and now at Brookings and I did eight years ago where we talked face-to-face -face with Tea Party people in several regions of the country and attended their local grassroots uh, meetings. I just want to remind you very quickly of what happened in the early Obama presidency. Um, by two months in, several months in, there were tax day rallies all over the United States, 542 counties. By Late 2009 through 2011 or 12, 
There were active tea parties. We estimated then about 1,000. I think we missed about 500 and uh, all over the country. And these were not created by the Cokes. The Cokes were in some ways created by some of these people. In, in, in. They were voluntary meetings that occurred once a week or once a month. Uh, created by people who basically were raising the money the way people do in a church meeting, by selling uh, baked goods or s sometimes books and pins um, about heroes such as Sarah Palin. <laughs> then eight years later, the Donald Trump presidency uh, resulted in a very short period of time, even shorter, in a massive march that happened in Washington, D.C. But more to the point, some 600 cities around the United States, this is what caught my attention when I saw it, was how widespread the women's marches were. And even more people were involved uh, in those marches. Um, as people probably realize, two congressional staffers and three, I guess, more colleagues uh, wrote the Indivisible Guide, which in our view had its biggest effect before Indivisible became a professionally run organization. The guide itself was published online in late 2016. It picked up tactics from the Tea Party wave eight years before and told liberal people upset and outraged about Donald Trump that they could organize locally to affect national politics, a message that liberals needed to hear so that they didn't just focus on the presidency. There was no president to focus on anymore. <laughs> uh, our research involves assembling maps of how widespread Tea Parties then and resistance groups now are in the key states, the four that I'm visiting plus others we're studying. And these are preliminary maps. We've developed more sophisticated ones since. But the fact of the matter is that uh, both Tea Party voluntary organizing and local resistance organizing were widespread across the states. And that's remarkable because it means that center-left people forming anti-Trump resistance groups have broken out of the metropolitan college town strongholds that you might have expected them to be in if they were only reflecting p left partisanship. So when you hear people telling you that all resistance groups are left progressive, don't believe it for a minute. So um, let me just say a little bit quickly about how they formed. Uh, we literally are able to trace the biographies Two to four leader initiators usually started these things. They often met online or at marches, on, on way to marches in Washington or in their regions. Uh, they would form local uh, founding meetings in libraries or restaurants, very similar to tea parties actually, except that tea parties sometimes met in churches. Uh, and they um, started learning all about uh, the issues in their <laughs> local area, mastering the gerrymandered landscape of representation in Congress and the state legislatures, um, and spent much of the first year uh, demonstrating and, act and writing letters and postcards and appearing at local representatives' office to try to save the Affordable Care Act. In the process, for the first time ever, teaching most Americans what was actually in the Affordable Care Act, which the Democratic Party had not bothered to explain for eight years. And during that year, public opinions shifted, and the Affordable Care Act is now considerably more popular than Donald Trump. Um, here are some of the pictures, I love pictures, of the kinds of people who formed these groups, including one in the basement of a church in Ohio reciting a citizen's credo that is modeled on the Christian credo. Um, church influences are all over the place in non-metropolitan areas in the formation of these groups. Liberal Protestants, Jews, the occasional Muslim are active in them. Um, Two-thirds to 90 percent of grassroots resistors in our research, in the research across Pennsylvania, and in national surveys 
are older white women. It's not a glamorous category, <laughs> but that's who's organizing. And that is who has always organized voluntarily when things spread across much of the United States. They are sometimes retired, sometimes they are mothers of younger children, but usually they are in the mid-50s to their early 60s. They are teachers, they are librarians, they are healthcare people, they are small business women. Uh, those are the people. They have considerable skills already and uh, have devoted them to organizing voluntarily. Most say that they are Democrats and they vote for Democrats, but others in, are disgruntled independents and some uh, disgruntled Republicans. They have organized, like the Tea Party did back then, outside of the formal political party organizations, but over the course of the last year have often infiltrated, run people for office in the local parties and are taking them over and revitalizing them from below. Uh, we ask people in um, questionnaires, on online questionnaires, why they got involved. Opposition to Trump is very important, but so is the desire to save or improve American democracy. And democracy reforms in action and in principle, such as concern with voting rights, concern with immigrant rights, and um, um, civil rights are central for all of these groups. Um, you can get copies of these from the, from the conference organizers and read them. I just want to say a few things by way of comparison. Both of these widespread electorally induced voluntary movements were sparked by fear and anger about a president who outraged partisans on the other side. Um, but it's interesting to, to hear what the partisans say about why they're angry. In the case of Obama, one hears from Tea Party people anger about his being as a black man, son of a foreigner, college professor, very bad category in Tea Party <laughs> land, uh, and um, as somebody who caters to young people and immigrants. In the case of, and that aligns with the ethno-nationalist core of grassroots Tea Party anger. It's not really about closed factories at the grassroots among the activists. Um, in the case of the grassroots resistance, uh, Donald Trump fills them with horror because of his nasty things he says about every category of people. But I think at the most fundamental, it's the feeling that he represents a selfish disregard of the community and public good. And that connects to a very central theme in this kind of organizing. Local groups do very similar things in both cases. In many ways, they educate themselves and their fellow citizens and people they're in contact with about how American democracy works at all levels. Both movements have generated enormous numbers of people, I think the resistance even more, to run for office, for local offices, for local party offices, for state legislatures, and of course for Congress. Uh, they both cut their teeth on the fight over the major redistributive battle at the national level in our time, which is the Affordable Care Act. Um, and they both are very complex, and I guess for this conference I need to say this, I don't believe in bottom-up versus top-down. These manifestations are very complex fields of organizations with parts that are organized from the top down and parts that are organized locally. And the interesting thing is how they connect in the middle and to the degree to which they, the local groups associate in federated linkages. And that is happening, I think, more among the resistors now than it did among the Tea Parties before. In key states like Pennsylvania and North Carolina, you see statewide umbrella coordinating groups that are not ordering anybody around, but are bringing people together and allowing them to learn lessons across localities and engage the state level of government, which is so critical in American federalism. Uh, and I'll wrap up quickly. What are the relations with the major political parties? That is a money question in our research. 
um, there's no question that the grassroots Tea Party, as well as the top-down, ultra-right, free market people, pushed the Republican Party off the edge to the right. Two different kinds of right-wingism. Uh, but they, they were, from the beginning, pulling Republicans away from the center and from any ability to compromise with Democrats or anyone else. And Tea Parties usually didn't reach out very much to other groups in their environment. That's not true for the grassroots resistance. The grassroots resistance, like most center-left people in America, almost has too many things to reach out to, too many things to worry about, too many issues to be concerned about, and burnout can occur. But they definitely are reaching out to immigrant rights groups, to the NAACP, even in places where it's all white people. Um, and they work with the unions wherever there are unions around to be worked with that are willing to reach out. And they are not pulling the Democratic Party to the left in most places. I'm not talking about Berkeley or Cambridge, but in most places. They're not. They're, they're pushing to uh, get the Democratic Party to open up, to let new people in and new energy in. And if that doesn't happen, then they work with state parties or with campaigns uh, on the Democratic side but they're having an enormous revitalizing effect in a lot of counties and a lot of places, as we are learning in our detailed work across the state of Pennsylvania. So um, I'll just say that we've done two waves of questionnaires to resistance group leaders to ask them about their relations to local Democrats, and the latest wave just collected shows that across Pennsylvania, in many places, the local resistance groups have moved in and taken over a lot of local uh, Democratic Party posts, or they've learned to work cooperatively with local Democratic Party leaders. Not everywhere. In some places, the old boy cliques are still in charge and are rejecting them, in which case they just organize separately. But that is happening, and I think to a greater degree than it happened, um, or at least to different ends than it happened with the Tea Party. Uh, eight years ago. So uh, I'll just say that I think what next? The Tea Party Republicans are, have not gone away. Sometimes they're still meeting, but they've mostly become the core of the Trump Republican base. Um, they are, if still alive, they're absolutely as determined as ever before. Um, it's an open question whether the Democratic Party will be completely remade and revitalized by local resistance groups, along with groups that are active in more liberal locales than the ones we're looking at principally, but I think it's very possible. And I think that uh, we may see a new kind of politics that echoes the inside out idea, because in places where women volunteers <coughs> went door to door, weekend after weekend after weekend to elect an Anthony Delgado in New York or a Connor Lamb in southwestern Pennsylvania or um, uh, uh, Wilder in, in, in the collar counties around uh, Pennsylvania or, or in Orange County. Uh, in most cases, those activists are keeping in touch with the candidates and the candidates are keeping in touch with them. And that is a revolution at the base of the Democratic Party that, of the likes we haven't seen for a long time. And so I think there's reason to be hopeful about this if the Democratic Party can avoid falling into pure presidentialism over the next two <laughs> years and in conjunction with the national media completely undercutting the momentum that exists across the country in the states and localities, so. That's great, thank you so much, Seth. Even at that last minute, media now, we have to worry about it. Grassroots media and the loss of local newspapers is uh, one of the themes we haven't really explored, but it is worthwhile, I think. Um, okay, uh, Bill. Thank you for that segue on the on the media, and, uh, and I wanna thank Theta for the presentation she just gave because it's a solid reminder that um, there is a tendency among progressives to think that, oh, it's grassroots or it's going to be good. Um, but it can also be evil and we should not be uh, ignorant of that. It's, it's very essential to understand that there's a lot of politics going on. I, I, I would reinterpret where we are right now. Uh, 
I think the the top down that has been rejected is really not a rejection of top down, but and and I think we and I guard people against glamorizing the bottom up precisely because it could be the Tea Party. Um, and, and, an, and a strong element of the Tea Party is Southern victimization, which is a hatred of top down. I mean, this is the Southern victim, the white Southern victimization myth, right, is the federal government is running us and ruining us and they're the it and we hate them and they hate us. Um, what, what this is a real rejection of, I would say, is neoliberalism. Um, I think it is a rejection of us economists um, and the sycophant way in which economics has evolved uh, as a way to, to project uh, either inevitable or um, good forces that have bad effects. So Americans have been told that all of this rise in inequality is the result of good stuff. Uh, and it's unfortunate that many of you have not benefited, like 99% of you. Um, <laughs> but trust us, it's for the good. And I think that is what has reached its end. And I would hope that we would be far more careful and, and not <laughs> reject um, things that come from the top, particularly because some of, some of what's going on now is a greater understanding of a wider range of people about systemic challenges and an understanding that you can't solve this locally. It's not a local issue at all. There are systemic issues. So where is my, in this midst of pessimism, <laughs> uh, where is my optimism? Um, and what do I see as the hurdles? I, I think one of the hurdles is a cynicism that has been brought about by the mechanism, a couple of the mechanisms through which neoliberalism subverted American democracy. So I'm, I'm treating this from the Reagan era forward, but you can include Jimmy Carter forward if that's the way you wish to do it. But it, it was the, the, the neoliberal idea that we can have this wonderful uh, libertarian utopia and we could deregulate and we could walk away from the New Deal, including New Deal institutions on every level, one of which is important to small d democracy, which is unions. And the undermining of unions has a huge impact on small d democracy. Why? Because it's the one place where black and white and brown and Jewish and Catholic and Hindu and Buddhist uh, and atheist and gender neutral and cisgender and whatever, those workers have to come together in a common purpose, elect shop stewards, they have to elect people who are gonna bargain for them, and they feel and experience the immediacy of democracy in a most profound way as it affects their immediate economic well-being. It's a neat laboratory. And it makes you believe in the democratic process, on top of which it puts you in touch with an empowering agency because the labor movement funds itself. And so therefore, it's not beholden to anybody else. And it can voice the concerns, the economic concerns, of workers. And as a consequence, it's an army that can go out and push politicians. But of course, as that voice diminishes, where is the counterbalance? There, there, are, there is no other grassroots organization that has the funding source the size of the labor movement. You know, all of the rest of them, no matter what we think of them. And you know, I work for the National Urban League, I love the National Urban League, it has no independent funding sources. It comes from corporations which limits what you're gonna say. Because if your money comes from Walmart, there's a limit to what you're gonna say. Fight for 15, <laughs> put up a big banner, right? Um, and, and, and those others are hardline, nonpartisan, apolitical. 
because they have been structured as 501c3s. They seek money from both sides. They try not be partisan. But when it comes time for elections, somebody has to be on somebody's side. And that inability to have that power against politicians means there isn't this countervailing power. And that, to me, more than anything else, allowed the rise of the neoliberal voice at the state and local level. And then the fault of the Democratic Party, I would say at the top down, the thinking presidential, is that allowed uh, Democrats at the national level to look to Wall Street for money because people on Wall Street could care less what's happening on your main street or who's in charge in Harrisburg. I don't care. Uh, but if you live in Pennsylvania, Harrisburg matters. And if the union density in Pennsylvania collapses, then it matters who's going to be in charge in Harrisburg. And it's going to make a difference in Lansing which it did by a lot, and it's gonna make a difference uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, which it did a lot, that you, you lose the, the union density and you lose the voice of working people who could push back against different agendas. And then, as we just heard, the, the way in which we have allowed technology to play this liberal, this extreme form of libertarianism uh, brought about the end of local newspapers having any any voice and so therefore the referee got removed from the table so you had a we had a loss of a countervailing power and then we had the loss of the referee and that to me raised cynicism you have a bunch of people who who do not generally speaking participate in multiracial multi-gender organizations to to reach a, a point together and then and then you you lose this referee who can tell people uh, what's fair what's foul and I think the revolt against Trump is he's carried the argument to the extreme that, that he's gone beyond what Americans think is fair um, and he's gone way into the foul region so where's my cause of optimism? My, my cause of optimism is that the liberal neoliberal agenda uh, wedded with uh, racism and the ultimate uh, libertarianism of the South, uh, which isn't libertarianism, it's really how to run an oligarchy because the South at its root, the whole point of Southern government is to be an oligarch, right? I mean, they have their racist side because that's part of how they maintain their oligarchy. But the point of a Southern government from the beginning was to serve rich people. It only served slave masters. The only point of government is I need to catch slaves. I need to have a road or a waterway that gets me to my products to the market. That's it. There's no other reason for government. And the moment we let Southerners rewrite their constitutions, we saw them explicitly strip the opportunity for localism. When you look at the Mississippi Constitution and you look at the other Southern states, um, home rule, out. So you see cities like Memphis that try and raise their minimum wage, they get slapped down because in Tennessee, <laughs> the oligarchs get to say, no, 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 Memphis. You're still going to sweat for 725, um, and and Mem and Mississippi was the originator of this idea before we got to California that we would limit taxation. Why? Because during Reconstruction and the establishment of public services in the South, mainly public schools, instantly the slave owner class that returned to power understood, oh, you're going to tax us. No. And you see in the new Mississippi, the old new Mississippi Constitution, clear restrictions against raising taxes. And you know it takes super majorities. You can't raise taxes unless you get you know seventy percent of the legislature, or you can't uh, raise taxes above a certain amount. Uh, th th these structures were built in. They are systemic. Uh, and so, 
the strikes on the part of teachers in red states, in West Virginia and Kentucky and Oklahoma, are where this extreme neoliberal oligarchy type government ran to its limit, so much so that the teachers were able to fight back against this uh, mean austerity. Even in a red state, they could finally get the cognitive dissonance that the rest of us always are stupefied by, right? Because it's like, why if you're the poorest state in the United States and you can only get money except from the federal government, but you vote against you vote for politicians who are against the very programs that you're dependent on. And you know, the rest of us are just like, how does this happen? But finally the teachers were able to hit at the core because uh, the people in these states understood that their kids were being robbed. In Oklahoma, they couldn't even keep the schools open five days a week. Uh, they could show you pictures of bathrooms, not in inner city schools, not in inner city schools, but in white counties where kids couldn't use the bathroom because there were holes in the ceiling and because some of the toilets didn't flush. They had carried out this no government, no taxes, no public expenditure to the point where the teachers could engage the community. And it had to be statewide because uh, it's not possible to solve the problem of the adequate funding at the local level. And this is why you saw this statewide movement uh, in these cases. And it's unbelievable unbelievably heroic that they were able to accomplish it. Now, it didn't change politics. We got one Democrat elected in Oklahoma after all of this. And you saw the state of West Virginia rebel against the teachers. And you would have thought, hey, didn't you just teach us a lesson? Didn't you just whoop us? And no, they turned around and the state legislature whipped on the teachers <laughs> right afterwards. Uh, and the teachers had to walk out again just to remind them um, but but this distance that has been put between the politicians, even in that state, and the median voter is so big that these politicians felt they could still vote against what was clearly a popular movement within their state. Now, of course, in West Virginia, it was very greatly helped out because there's an existing labor movement and labor history resistance. So the coal miners were vital to what took place in West Virginia. The oil field workers uh, who are essential in Oklahoma were able to stand behind the teachers in Oklahoma. But these are states with low union density. Uh, the teachers don't actually have the right to bargain. They don't actually have the right to belong to a union. I um, mean, yet they, they stood up. So, I mean, there is some cause for um, optimism because this idea that we, we could carry this to, to the extreme um, when it comes to a government that responds to the people showed a limit uh, that people could energize. It has affected graduate students. You see again and again the success of graduate students organizing. Why? Because without having a national debate, our nation has agreed that Higher education as a policy is an individual investment with individual returns, and therefore we as a public do not need to invest in it. If you want higher education, you benefit, you pay for it, you go to debt for it, whatever. is. I don't get any benefit from it, and I don't care about it. And if you're running a university, that means where, <laughs> where do I get the money from in this constrained world? And you get it out of squeezing uh, graduate students because you got to squeeze somebody to get the money. Um, and you've seen the response of graduate students around the country where they have the opportunity uh, to fight back and, and try and organize. And that's a positive. Um, in the black community, there is a bigger voice and concern about how we have just totally ignored the conversation of race, and our huge impatience uh, with politics as usual. And here, again, it's not 
uh, local. I mean, it's local where you have seen revolts against state prosecutors, and people have been very active in going against uh, the impunity with which local police can kill black people. <laughs> but there's this deeper conversation that is resonating about the wealth gap and needing to close the wealth gap and a deep understanding that this is a systemic problem and a bigger focus actually on the presidential electoral politics because it's a deeper understanding that things are out of whack. And I think a deeper appreciation when you understand the racial component, half of blacks live in the South. And I'm sorry, we saw the election in Georgia and Florida and Texas and there are people who want to celebrate and oh, this is wonderful. They lost, they lost, they lost. So I think you gotta take a dose of reality about what are the limits of transforming Mississippi and making Mississippi not Mississippi. Good luck. The last time we made Mississippi not Mississippi, we invaded it and we occupied it. And the idea that Mississippi would have a minimum wage other than 725 because of some grassroots organizing, good luck. So, so there, there has to be this deeper understanding. The reason we are at this moment, I think, again, and the reason why the federal level ends up being the center of the fight is for the same reason that we had the Civil War. There are hard-line differences. They are strongly regional, and as long as we have a Senate that elects two people from each of those red states, and many members of Congress from each of those states, we're gonna be confronted with this division. The South did not die, it didn't go away. There are people who still believe in an oligarchy as if it were a democracy. They will still pursue limiting who gets to vote because that's what oligarchs do. And they're still gonna limit the will of the people, and we are again back to, can this experiment, this fragile experiment, a uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, endure? That to me is why the lines are so hard and they're not gonna be erased that easily and as much as one can be encouraged by sort of localism, the bottom up in 1860 was a revolt against continuing to tolerate oligarchs. And the final realization that one of us is gonna have to win. Those of us who believe in democracy or the oligarchs because the oligarchs can't be pleased. We can't keep compromising with them. Because, I mean, what is, it that, what is the compromise if I rip a child out of a mother's hand and put the child in one detention and send the mother off to jail? The compromise is you get to do one child, but you can't do the other one. That's my compromise, it's 50-50. <laughs> What's the compromise? It's a deep value proposition here. And so if, if the bottom up matters, I think the bottom up is gonna matter when it comes to this issue of, of, of one side finally deciding they've had enough. Uh, and as much as people wanna avoid it, I'm sorry. Couldn't avoid it last time, you're not gonna be able to avoid it this time. Uh, hopefully it's not because somebody invite, invades or takes over a military base in South Carolina. Oh boy, <laughs> okay. Well, I mean actually, you know, we, we're, we are seeing a lot of this kind of left populism out there and I, I hope that you're not suggesting too many urban riots and so on, but uh, we do see them <laughs> and uh, uh, w I, I, I will put on the table something I read about that in Jackson, Mississippi, the Jackson Compact, that there have been some grassroots organizing for, oh, yeah, and so yeah. there, I mean, it's possible at the local level in Mississippi to get around some of it, but they have encountered a lot of Well, and there's obstacles. Georgia and North Carolina, which right. are not at all the same as right. Mississippi and Alabama. Right, absolutely. Not at all. They're yeah. close to it. 
We will, we will um, now move on to, to a discussion, I guess, of regionalism, because I know this is last but not least, <laughs> <laughs> Margaret. Okay, I'm not going to be that pessimistic. Good. Um, Good. <laughs> so uh, the remarks that I want to make uh, stem from research I've been doing at the metropolitan level. And uh, I'm interested in new patterns of inequality across metro areas, so the growth of poverty in suburban areas. And I'm, I'm looking at 25 different metros, but with a focus on three, uh, Chicago, Atlanta, and Houston. So I'm trying to uh, understand some of the changes that are occurring in Sunbelt cities that often are not looked at that much uh, by urban scholars. And, uh, among the things that I'm looking at are efforts to build the political voice of low-income communities and to expand the public resources that they have, because particularly in the Sun Belt, it's been the place of, of neoliberalism, weak uh, public uh, goods. And these are also traditionally weakly organized places. and. Um, and weakly organized when it comes to low-income people and often confronting uh, far more organized uh, forces who want to limit their access to resources. So what I want to do in my comments today is highlight what bottom-up means in this context uh, and the, the kind of main takeaway that I want to emphasize is that bottom-up is not just local. Uh, Bottom-up requires the uh, ability to act across political boundaries, uh, both horizontally, so in the metro area, uh, from city to suburb or back again, but, and it also requires uh, the ability to act vertically. So you need allies in the state legislature, and you may need uh, to change some things in Washington to enable uh, local work that you want to do. So and because of that, I sort of, I prefer the term locally rooted to bottom up. Um, so what I want to do in my comments is just to highlight sort of three instances of how translocal works or doesn't work in the, in the cases I've been looking at. And then I want to conclude with some comments trying to directly pull out lessons uh, to some of the questions raised uh, in the memo. And so when I think of translocal, I do think that there is something new afoot. And I think in some ways it started in the 1990s with uh, efforts to build capacities that would cross, um, not vertically, but would models that could be used across different kinds of metropolitan areas. And I trace it in some ways to the community organization ACORN, which was an organization that was located uh, in different places across the country. And they really modeled together this uh, alliances with local labor to build this model of the living wage uh, across um, metropolitan areas across the country. And this, I think, was something new compared to organizing in the 1960s, which tended to be more vertical, and labor itself and community organizations themselves were more in particular places and less horizontally, this kind of translocal models, let's try to implant them from place to place, which is what I think started uh, in the 19, um, uh, 1990s. So, you know, one question is what can we expect of this kind of translocal organizing? We know that there's limits to it. Um, I just read that 60% uh, of Americans now live in states where uh, uh, the, the uh, ability of local uh, governments to raise the minimum wage has been preempted by the state government. So we know that you know, this kind of local borrowing has its limits um, when it comes to things like uh, preemption. But I think that one of the things that has happened is sort of the injection of new ideas and organizations from the outside um, that see things differently than the local organizations do and that create new kinds of possibilities. And I'll give you one example. Um, from the research I've been doing, um, I've been looking a lot around transportation equity. And um, uh, one of the cases 
uh, is in Atlanta where the public transportation system never extended beyond the city of Atlanta for racial reasons. The white uh, counties would not vote in favor of expanding this public uh, resource. Um, but uh, over the last 20 years, a county south of the city of, of Atlanta, Clayton County, has had a racial transition, um, became majority minority, and uh, it had to abolish its public transportation system in, uh, during the recession. And so you have a county uh, uh, with a high poverty level, really hit badly by the recession, uh, and no access to public transit when the majority of jobs are located on the other side of the metropolitan area. And there eventually was uh, a, a movement, and this past year, Clayton County, or two years ago, Clayton County became uh, the first county to vote to join the public transportation system, something that had been envisioned 40 years ago. And it looks like a classic kind of bottom-up thing. Churches were involved, there was mobilization, of people to vote in favor of it, but it wasn't purely bottom up. It was a translocal organization, actually linked to Policy Link, that that came to Atlanta to do community benefits agreements. It's hard to do community benefits agreements in Atlanta. It's you know doesn't have the kind of uh, force behind it to make that happen. But it looked around and saw new opportunities, and then connected with state legislators to force the locals, politicians, who actually didn't want to vote in favor of joining it because they had doubts about expanding and being close, more closely connected to Atlanta. So to me, yes, it was bottom up, it looked bottom up, but it depended on translocal organizations uh, and it was top down because the support of uh, certain kinds of uh, supportive state legislators was necessary to, to remove a local blockage. So I think in a lot of the local cases that I have, you find local blockages and you need something from the outside to remove those blockages to get uh, some kind of forward uh, momentum. And it doesn't just happen in some spontaneous way. Uh, from the bottom up, particularly with these issues about expanding the public sector in ways that benefit low-income communities and low-income communities of color. So another kind of translocal effort that um, I looked at, and I, I think these are critical, but they are much harder, are uh, urban-rural uh, coalitions uh, to go to the state level and pursue policy changes that expand the public sector in ways that benefit low-income communities in both rural and urban areas. Um, and I think these kind of coalitions are uh, essential for countering the right, which is organized very actively uh, to, uh, to in-state legislatures. Um, and I looked at a case, it was almost 20 years ago now, called Build Illinois Transit. It was a, a labor was part of it, citizen action, and it was a statewide campaign to expand the pool of public resources uh, for transit, because the idea is we can't get anything done at the local level in Chicago. Let's go higher, expand the pool of resources, and then we'll be able to achieve our local goals. I mean, this is an example of understanding that sometimes when the pool of resources is too small to get a claim, go outside the local level. Um, they held hearings around the state, got some state legislatures, uh, legislators in char, uh, on, on board, but was ultimately not successful. And you know, the lesson that I take away from that is one-off campaigns like this are not gonna have a very high chance of success. And that there are so many barriers now to these kind of rural, urban linkages. In some ways, in the past, those linkages were bargained through the Democratic Party because many of the rural areas were also Democratic areas, and now you've got these partisan differences. So to the extent that this is gonna happen, it's gonna require seeding organizations in these rural areas that are attentive to the needs and the lack of uh, institutions there uh, regarding health care and the other kinds of uh, things, hospitals, et cetera, that rural areas lack, but that are also huge issues in low-income urban communities. 
So I did some work with a student on healthcare access in California, and the pattern there um, was, again, this movement across levels of government. So what we saw was a consumer labor coalition that, without going into all the details, but a consumer labor coalition that was able to capture resources at the state level uh, in, in the terms of um, ongoing resources uh, in the form of a, of a very well-endowed uh, uh, foundation that then was able to seed SEED groups in the rural areas that didn't have those organizations. And we argued that it was one of the things that made the Affordable Care Act so successful to implement in the case of California that all this organizational work had been done and again, it was uh, an alliance of urban ver and rural, but it wasn't making that alliance and then going up. It was actually a little bit the way you're describing. It was through the um, uh, a more urban-based, getting the resources and then moving down to create those capacities in the um, rural areas, which are dominated by oligarchs and, uh, and elites who don't have an interest in serving. Uh, the low-income communities there. Um, and then the final example I want to um, uh, talk about is the, is the importance of vertical action. So as another kind of transportation equity case I looked at um, in Chicago, you know, when the um, uh, transportation uh, laws were changed uh, over 20 years ago, the idea was that there would be a lot more participation, that the highway builders would not have so much control over transportation dollars, there would be more opportunity for it to serve the needs of low-income people, uh, environmental uh, goals. Uh, but in Chicago, um, the, the highway builders had the uh, controlled everything uh, at the state level, and they basically ignored changes in federal law and continue to control those resources. And so it took a, a large mobilization of elites at the local level to go to the state level to change the law before you could even begin to operate at the local level. So you see this kind of removal of obstacles is sometimes needed at um, uh, going vertical. So not bottom-up in my mind, but locally rooted that has the capacity to act across boundaries and also to connect with higher levels of government. So, you know, I read the memo um, and I found the context memo really interesting and I wanted to kind of respond directly to some of the questions that you raised just with some of the thoughts that I had from the research I've been doing. So one of the questions that, that they pose in the memo is, how do you keep the state and federal from overshadowing the local? How do you keep it from, you know, kind of making the local just um, uh, disappear? And I, I think that the way that the what goes on at the state and federal should be seen as uh, creating policy levers or openings that enable local action. So a lot of what the way to think about it is not, oh, we'll get this done at the federal level and then all our problems will be solved, but rather that the federal level, you may be able to do things that make your local work easier, that put the thumb on the scales in favor of some of the kinds of uh, local work. And so I know uh, Greg's done a lot of work on the uh, Community Reinvestment Act. The Community Reinvestment Act is an example, kind of a regulation that changes the status of local groups in terms of the tools that they have uh, to be able to um, uh, challenge what, um, what, what banks do and where they lend, requirements for participation. So thinking about what happens higher up as things that can enable local action, not substitute for local action. Um, a second question that you raised is um, how can bottom-up activism percolate up and out into the broader political system? And here I think, you know, there's a couple of things. And one of them is something that organizers from the Alinsky style of, of organizing and all of their associated 
uh, types know, which is that it can never be, activism can never be just about getting the policy win. Uh, it has to be about building the organization. Um, what it, and, and ACORN actually, and you know, they built a faulty organization, but um, they did understand this, that use the policy win to build the organization. Um, and this is critical, especially in places where elites dominate, because you can have a policy win that is quickly eroded unless you have the ongoing capacity to monitor it. Actually, I was just reading about Benetton's bridge in Italy and how nobody had, people read that in the New York Times today, nobody had the power to, to monitor it. But local groups, you can't just have a win unless you can monitor that win because elites have so much power at the local level. And the other lesson, uh, which is uh, about, how, about percolating, and this was something that a lot of Alinsky groups did not do, is that um, it ultimately has to be connected to electoral politics. This is what uh, Manuel was just saying, um, is that um, candidates have to see themselves as advancing local efforts, and these local groups that, I don't know, they were very, in, in the past, community organizing groups were very, uh, wary of electoral politics and the, the sense now that you have to get engaged in it, I think it will make a huge difference and has, I mean, obviously it has made a huge difference in California. Um, how, how many minutes do I have? Two, three? I don't have room. You have two. Two, okay. So we're, I, I also want to say something about race and eth ethnicity or ethnic background. Where does it fit in? And in the work that I've been doing, it can be a source of strength uh, for for removing local blockages, that if you can do translocal organizing at the metro level on the basis of racial or ethnic or immigrant solidarities, um, that can make a huge difference. And one place that I looked at was the city of Waukegan, uh, uh, predominantly um, immigrant by um, five or 10 years ago. Um, but a very anti-immigrant politics. And of course, this is happening all over metropolitan America. It's not just our cities anymore, but these places that you wouldn't think of, they're now full of what is the new America. And the question is, what, what will it be like for them? Well, this was uh, no political power, but it was uh, uh, the groups within the city of Chicago, pro-immigrant groups uh, that moved to um, mobilize and help them mobilize themselves. So that, again, it's not, it doesn't happen just purely local up, but may require some of this translocal stuff based on racial or ethnic uh, solidarity. And in the case of Atlanta, I mean, it was purely racial, the reason that there was no MARTA, um, no public transportation throughout the region. So building that racial solidarity uh, in this county that has changed in this new demography of Metro America creates new possibilities. Um, and also I'll close just one of the things that I thought about as I read the context memo. Uh, I know there's this idea of local patriotism. Oh, it makes me very nervous, that language of local patriotism. I think it can very easily become elite driven and squeeze out initiatives that help low income people. So many localities and local leaders are so focused on raising property values and on gentrification that I think local patriotism can so easily slip into that. We're going to make our place great again by uh, gentrifying. Um, and so I, this is where I think uh, both translocal uh, strength from the outside, but also conflict is essential because it's really through conflicts, protests, using regulatory strategies, using legal strategies, you set a stage for what might be an inclusive local patriotism, but it won't happen without conflict, so. Thank you so much. Well, thanks to everybody for staying more or less on time. And, um, Right, branding. We have to worry about branding as well. Um, Clarence, did you want to add anything in response to what you've heard before? Any comments um, on, is this all what you meant by bottom-up politics? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 
I think it is a term that is still evolving. And as I commented earlier, you know, in our first uh, cut at talking about this a year ago, our three speakers all emphasized the importance of the intergovernmental context. Yeah. And that's for lots of different reasons. You know, Margaret has talked about the levers and, and so on. That was very much evident in their uh, comments. The thing, I mean, the, you said so much, so thank you all for that. <laughs> but the thing that stands out to me at this point is the emphasis that has come on the sort of middle connecting, you know, sometimes horizontally, sometimes vertically, but the vertical has to have not just action at the top, which may indeed be extremely important, but you've got to have the connection to the actual folks at the local level. Um, and I guess what I would add about local patriotism, when I, when I read that, that term um, in our towns, the point they were making is that most people in most of these uh, places, uh, and Columbus was like the largest of their small towns, uh, but most of them are much smaller, go about their daily lives not caught up in the partisan mass media, you know, conflicts and so on of the national level, but they think, you know, we can do our own thing. And Margaret, your comment about the danger of that spilling over into, well, local elites will do their own thing, uh, I think is a really important point. I mean, I could go on and on because so much has been opened up. So well, we're, we're going to have some, uh, we're gonna have some Q&A after a break, but first I want to introduce uh, my colleague from GW, Greg Squires, who, who uh, wanted to make some over, overview remarks as well. So let me just tell you a little bit about him. He's a professor of sociology and public policy and public administration at GW and a member of the uh, advisory board of the John Marshall Law School Fair Housing Legal Support Center in Chicago, the Fair Housing Task Force of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the Social Science Advisory Board of the Poverty and Race Research Action, Action Council here in DC. He served as a consultant for civil rights uh, organizations around the country and on the Consumer Advisory Council of the Federal Reserve Board. Um, already mentioned by Margaret, he's published a, a load of books on questions of uh, lending discrimination and the um, Fight for Fair Housing, uh, most recently the name of his uh, recently edited book, um, The Fight for Fair Housing, Causes, Consequences, and Future Implications of the 1968, yes, it's 50 years, folks, of the 1966 fair, Federal Fair Housing Act. Greg, you want to say a few words? Yeah, and I will be brief. Uh, I'd forgotten about the Federal Reserve appointment. That was not a lesson in bottom-up politics. Uh, but when, when, when we got together, Clarence and Derek and Blair and Allison and Hil Hillary and I, that it, it seems the word gridlock is what brought us together, gridlock at the top. And we've been engaged in a two-year discussion that I think could be characterized, to, to paraphrase Jesse Jackson, in uh, examining the paralysis of ideological analysis. Uh, and seeing what might be done to break out of that. And after two years of discussion, what occurs to me in the immortal words of Buffalo Springfield, there's something happening here, but what it is ain't exactly clear. Uh, many are celebrating local patriotism, the, the local revolution, various names for it, people of various political stripes, David Brooks, Thomas Friedman, the Fallows, Bruce Katz and Jeremy Nowak. Uh, 
people are grabbing onto this. Uh, but one of the things that occurs to me, and, and some of the panelists noticed, mentioned this, this isn't exactly new. Uh, I mean, I grew up at the risk of further dating myself. Um, in the 1960s, reading Milton Kotler's book, Neighborhood Government, the Local Foundations of Political Life. And in the 70s, reading Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, a Study of Economics as if People Mattered. And of course, there's even a longer history of, of extolling the virtues of, of localism. Uh, and there are many exciting examples of local initiatives, many things that are going on today that weren't going on just a few years ago. But I think one of the key challenges, as Katz and Nowak argue in their book, quote, how do we move new localism from a loosely connected civic enterprise to a powerfully linked national and global movement? And I think related to this, how do we get local officials to understand that their job is not, as Sam Bass Warner said has long been the case, keeping the peace among individual money makers? Um, uh, that, uh, uh, or as Richard Schrager powerfully argues in his book, uh, City Power, uh, how do we get them to move away from the decentralization growth thesis or, or the notion that city growth is simply a matter of offering inducements to attract private capital? Um, and now Coates, Katz and Nowak, again, among the biggest celebrants of, of, of this local revolution, they point out in their book, and I'll quote them at some length, for every Pittsburgh there are dozens of cities still involved in traditional economy-shaping efforts that subsidize simple consumption, such as Major League Sports Stadium, rather than smart innovation. For every Copenhagen there are dozens of cities that are creating value for the private sector and then failing to maximize it for the public good, unquote. And with the recent pursuit of Amazon, I still wonder if Northern Virginia isn't going to turn out to be the biggest loser of the 238 cities that, that, that competed for them. And apparently New York is not out of the running yet either, uh, as there's continuing efforts to, to get them back. Um, and it does occur to me, though, part of building this local movement, if, if it's going to be built, uh, is recognizing the importance that state and federal governments play. And again, this is something that some of the panelists pointed to. Again, let me quote, some ca quote from Katz and Nowak. The federal government must do things that only it can do, including safeguarding national security, providing a stronger safety net than it presently does, pr providing guarantees of constitutional protections on civil rights, make smart national infrastructure investments, protecting natural resources, protecting the integrity of markets, and funding scientific research innovation, post-secondary education, to keep the nation competitive. Um, or as Richard Trager more directly says, no doubt the national government is still the main site for income redistribution. Having said that, I do see some signs of optimism. And I know Bill said he had signs of optimism, but I miss them. Uh, <laughs> and let me offer uh, a couple observations. I think there is some reason to believe that things can be done at the local level. I think that um, uh, today we see more and more significant actors in public, private, and nonprofit actor sectors engaged in these kinds of activities. Uh, social media enhances our ability to communicate about and disseminate good ideas. Now, no doubt we're living in a very polarized world. We do not all get our news from Walter Cronkite every night. But I don't think we're more divided than we were during the Civil Rights Movement or the Vietnam War, just to name a couple eras of, of at least some of our lifetimes. I also think there's a greater urgency. There's a growing recognition that climate change and other ecological developments threaten the sustainability of our communities, if not life as we know it. And many of the most innovative things on sustainability are going on at the local level. And despite temporarily, I hope, that we're living in a time when many parts of the federal government are evidence-free zones and many <laughs> at the local level traffic in alternative facts and absurd false equivalencies, we are learning more about how to address these issues. We're learning more because of scholars who are part of the Scholar Strategy Network. We're learning more because of the effectiveness of organizations like the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. We are in a position where we can do better today than we could yesterday. Let me conclude with a, an observation. I am a sociologist. I want to draw from Gerhard Lenski's classic 1966 book. Oh. Hillary is always making jokes that I'm dating myself. I'm going back to all these things from my graduate school days. He wrote a book called Power and Privilege. And this is a study of social stratification. And he raised what I think is still the most important question for us today when he said, quote, who gets what and why, unquote. One reason why I think local efforts are so critical is because 
in order to meaningfully participate in these discussions, in order to do more than vote, in order to actually become a decision maker and an actor, it's much easier to do this at the local level. You need to be there when these decisions are being made. Or as has often been said by many people before me, if you're not at the table, then you're probably on the menu. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> departmental politics. <laughs> okay, everybody. So um, this is your chance for questions and answers, and we'll go on for a while. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll have um, a, the panel make uh, one, uh, maybe two or th two or three minutes of a kind of last remarks kind of thing um, uh, to one another. You know. So let's let the audience, please, would you identify yourself um, when you uh, ask your question? Yes, my name is Jerry Hush. I'm an adjunct professor in the sociology department at American University, and my work has been primarily within the UN system. So I've been dealing with this issue of stakeholder involvement <laughs> for about 25 years. So what I'd like, my question is actually, the framework that I've been hearing <laughs> is pretty much what I would call dualistic, local or federal. Um, so I'm really curious where new understandings of complex social systems bring comes in. <laughs> the idea of emergence, that we're really not talking about bottom up or top down. We're talking about a whole new way in which we're going to deal with power and authority and decision making. And that in the US, it's clearly has been um, sort of bifurcated because of Trump and we have the either the liberals or the conservatives. But I really think as sociologists, I'm really curious as to the cutting edge of how do we deal with not just a systemic issue as was posted, but a complex systems issue. And that we have to deal, as I said, with issues of emergence and that there are key actors whose roles are shifting and that power, perhaps what we're seeing is this uh, whole new transition to the way power is utilized. Take a few a few questions. So you, maybe the panel will will make a few notes and how to respond to them. But let's hear from a, uh, a bunch of people before we turn to them. Yes, please. My name is Barbara Leach. I'm the founder. We're we're, of we're recording, so please wait for the microphone. Thanks. My name is Barbara Leach. I'm the founder of a small nonprofit called My Rural America Action Fund. We specialize in progressive communication to rural voters. So I would like to underline Manuel Piston's comment, there are no rural voters to be found in Berkeley. Well, there are also no rural voters to be found in a lot of cities and in where we're searching as particularly progressives and Democrats in uh, suburban women organizations. All of those are important. But we have to recognize, and you touched on it just a nanosecond, um, um, Hillary, that newspapers and ways to communicate in rural areas are often missing. The last um, research for how much broadband there is said it was missing 39% of rural voters rural citizens and their families. Um, there is a map, which I'm sure you've all seen, called the, the Media Desert Project that maps where <coughs> daily newspapers are and are not by zip code and by county congressional district. Um, if you look at a winning district in Iowa for the Democrats, that would be Iowa 3rd, S district Cindy Axony, 16 counties in that district. She won one. She got 56% in Polk County, Des Moines. She got 42% in three other counties, including the second most urban, which was Kansas Bluffs. And all the rest of those districts, counties, when you look at that map, have a penetration rate for newspapers of anywhere from about 11% to 20%. So when you combine that with a lack of broadband, we have not only a real need to
to identify progressive leaders, network them, help them be stronger leaders, build our local organizations, which some of those, um, Ms. Scopal, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing people's Ms. names Scopal. right. <laughs> um, but uh, we have a real need to build those organizations, and when we do, we have to build news networks to go with them because we have nothing taking up the gap of what big city newspapers that used to go across whole statewides, <laughs> um, they only suburb cover their su suburbs now, their suburban area and urban area. So we need to fill that gap, and we're going to have to learn to be a lot more creative about it. When I went in to talk to the DNC just in closing last <laughs> August about it, the senior leadership I met with said, well, I have to tell you that we've, had, we've not done anything in rural. We have had a lot of meetings, but we don't really know what to do. Well, there's a lot of things we can do. Okay. Okay, so le thank you very much, Barbara. Um, I, what I want to suggest is that uh, please try to ask a question. Uh, we, we love to hear, all, you have so much to contribute, How but are we, we have to keep to this. Yeah. Fill that gap. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a third question we can take before? Here's one. Oh, here's one. Okay. Uh, Royce Hansen, I'm lightly affiliated with the George Washington Institute of Public Policy. Um, how do you, how do these movements that you so beautifully characterized survive the the Plunkett rule uh, that reformers is more can, is morning glories? Uh, the movements that have survived have been political movements, the parties mm -hmm. and the unions, because they have a financial base and they have. Uh, a connection uh, that can be sustained over time. Mm -hmm. So are these just another set of today's flash in the pan? Good point. How sustainable are they? Do you want to take one more? I, I, well then we'll take the, to come back to the panel. My name is John Martin. I'm a public policy fellow here at the Wilson Center, and I call myself a recovering journalist um, because I spent 26 years with ABC News as a correspondent, national and international. I'm, anybody on the panel, perhaps William, perhaps Manuel, what should national j journalists be asking and looking for as they try to cover this movement at the lower levels? Yeah, no, that's a, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, since, uh, it seems like media's gotten a lot of attention today. Uh, Manuel? So a lot came up. I'll say a couple things. One, <laughs> which I, I think will emphasize something that Margaret was saying, is that duality is not correct. Localism versus a state level, or localism versus a national level, and that's kind of exactly the point of the translocal concept that she was trying to introduce. And I would say that it's certainly part of the California story as well, um, that there was really a conscious sense of geographic scaling, which is that you could not change the politics of the state unless you were always articulating a state strategy and a local strategy at the same time and doing the translocal thing to build things up. Um, second comment, so much has come up, is that I think it's kind of important to realize how deliberate, at least in California, the strategy was. So you can kind of think that we're going back and reconstructing reality from the, you know, reading the tea leaves of what happened. But I was on the founding board of the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, which decided that it would launch the living wage campaign in Los Angeles to build momentum for building ties between immigrants and labor, and that would then go on to have undocumented immigrants help be part of the electoral get out the vote group because although they couldn't vote, they could mobilize voters and that they would then use that to leverage an inside-outside strategy with regard to electing a mayor 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this was actually pretty carefully, you know, not perfectly executed, but pretty carefully laid out and intentional. And I think that that's sort of really important because the other part of this is that it really is a long game. We tend to look at maybe the mess that we're in and say, mm -hmm. how can we fix it instantly? Um, and we romanticize localism instead of thinking about what I think has been the real theory of change, which is how do you use local efforts where people need to find coalitions and compromises and use them to build uh, higher levels of political power to be able to change things, which is why I'm a little more optimistic, I think, than, uh, than Bill. So a couple things I uh, think that journalists might be looking for is, so one of the reasons why um, I wrote this book is because I was so pissed at uh, a journalistic rendering of California. Um, <laughs> the journalistic rendering was a cover of Newsweek as the state came back from its tough times, and it said on the front cover, altered state, sort of referring to our hallucinogenic uh, realities, right? And it had all these, you know, the, the, now the fiscal houses in order and a bunch of other things, and it said, uh, under Alter State, I had a picture of Jerry Brown, and it said, how Jerry Brown saved California. That was like such bad journalism, <laughs> because it was about sort of popping in and looking, <laughs> because it was about popping in and really sort of looking at the glossy, savior style kind of politics that we celebrate without getting in and digging in and saying, kind of what's been the grassroots effort that have been changing things on the ground. So I you know, think I'm seeing a little bit more of the reporting that's, I mean, this is a fascinating, uh, the, the Tea Party was fascinating, this resistance thing is fascinating, the fact that it's uh, so many women is fascinating, the fact that it's actually not left but sort of moderate, progressive in some kind of ways is fascinating. And I think a lot of like really digging in and trying to say what's happening at a grassroots level that creates the opportunity for political figures to then act, which is how the right wing of the GOP party based on the Tea Party politics was able, and Trump himself was able to do what he did. I think that's sort of really um, digging in. The one last thing, which is kind of partly what you asked, but not, but like any academic, I'll answer a question that you did not ask, but perhaps should have, um, <laughs> is, is uh, to, to get sort of at a, a grassroots level, too, um, about the way in which people are talking about race and racism, because I think we have this really easily counterposed thing of white working class people, you know, very racist, that, you know, et cetera, really disconnected. And in some communities, there's a lot of bridges being built. There's also a lot of um, issues with regard to someone who might hold sort of personally racist views, but at the same time has large parts of their family members that are actually of mixed ethnicities. And I think kind of getting down to the ground where people are really grappling with the race versus class issues um, is something that, that goes underreported because at a national level, it's really kind of easy to say race versus class, urban versus rural, et cetera, and really getting down and talking about what people are doing at a local level or a metropolitan level or a trans-local level really would be crucial for reporters. I have a, a number of things to say, but I gotta sort it out. You know, I think that the most important thing everybody has to remember about how civic life and politics and government work in America is that we live in a federated democracy. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. Um, I had to go to the University of Buffalo a week after the 2016 election and give a talk whose title I had given out months in advance called Understanding Election 2016. <laughs> that meant I had to get out from, in my citizen capacity, I had to get out from under the covers and start looking at the data very fast. And uh, this eight counties project was, in, was born the next weekend when three female professors started talking 
at a diner on a Saturday morning. But for me, the light went on when I, when I started to, I stopped listening to all that journalism that was about personalities, all that journalism that was about broad demographic categories, which both journalists and social scientists think in. If broad demographic categories determined our politics, Hillary Clinton would be in the White House. She won the national vote. We wouldn't have to be agonizing over which demo demographic group was responsible uh, for Donald Trump. He was elected by a tiny, intense minority. I mean, a modest, intense minority. Um, the thing that was so striking was to look across the states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania and see that places that Barack Obama had lost 60-40, she lost 70-30 and 80-20. And when I went to those places, people all told me the same thing. Hillary and her campaign never came here. Donald Trump came here. He was nearby, holding rallies. Uh, he sold nostalgia. He sold the idea that he cared about what was happening in those places. It was such a cheap date. Uh, but to the degree that the Hillary campaign came there, people said they sent some young man from Brooklyn at the last minute. These words exactly the same in North Carolina and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Ohio. And they told us to do things that didn't make any sense here. So um, that's not to criticize Hillary. I actually, it's Robbie Mook I criticize. But I think that um, the challenge is to realize that we do have to build these bridges and have these presences across many places in America in order to have a nation, a majority, a community. And our political system should be encouraging us to do that because the key to national power lies in Congress. The key to state power lies in state legislatures. That's why when the public sector unions were so strong in the 70s and 80s, there was that cross-level and cross-place integument and the public sector unions, which have been targeted by the Koch network for destruction, were the common carriers of the center left. They didn't just try to defend themselves, they try and didn't just talk about teachers and schools in each locality. Teachers were at the core of this. They talked about uh, a whole set of issues about how we could have a public sector that worked for everyone, including people outside the unions. I think that survives and has been reinvented in California. But it is gone in a lot of other places or greatly weakened. And so for the center left in this country, there has to be a way to recreate the connection of locally organized groups and citizens who can connect across places and who can elect legislators above all, as well as chief executives. I think that's beginning to happen, and as for how it will last, I think there's only one way it can last on the center left, and that's by revitalizing and building the Democratic Party as a genuinely state and locally rooted national network of organizations. Um, on the right, they've done it by building things like the Koch Network's Americans for Prosperity which my other research group has worked a lot on. We've reconstructed everything they did in a lot of places by using the Wayback Machine. We don't bother with money. We look at people and events. And, you know, they took over key states uh, with about a decade of persistent organizing. Uh, and when they took over, <laughs> they destroyed the public sector unions, which they saw as their chief competition. They did that in Wisconsin, above all. Um, Maybe some of that can be reversed, but it probably isn't going to be reversed by the unions themselves in most states because they may not have the capacity to elect and hold the politicians accountable to get it done. I think there's some hope for these new widely interconnected citizens groups, including their willingness to work across racial and metropolitan, non-metropolitan lines, but only if they're able to kind of infiltrate, re-energize, open up, and turn into a powerful machine, the Democratic Party, because I don't see where else that federated organization 
that's about using government and staffing government and holding government accountable and getting government to subsidize and remove obstacles, I don't see where else that's going to come from. And I do want to mention one other thing that I think everybody should be worried about. The right is transforming America's court system at a breathtaking mm -hmm. pace. Mm -hmm. So it is not going to be possible in the immediate future to rely simply on court cases and, and regulations uh, from the federal government. Kavanaugh is not really about abortion rights. He's about destroying the federal government's capacity to regulate the economy. That's the real plan, and it's about a, it's already underway. So what that means is tax and spend liberalism has to come back <laughs> because you can't get rid of the taxation power of the federal government. It's in the Constitution. And the nice thing about tax and spend liberalism is that it actually opens up opportunities uh, for building security and opportunity and lets a lot of decisions about how exactly you're going to regulate things play out somewhat more at the state and local level. But the key to that is going to be capturing Congress as well as the presidency. And the key to making that work for people everywhere is going to be capturing state legislatures. Um, California has to happen in many places. Right? Um, Can I jump in yeah. here? I don't know if yeah. we're going to have the other uh, panelists yeah. react to the yeah. questions, but again, Derek Heyer of the Metropolitan Policy Center, American University. And Theta, I want to react to something you said and also that, that Bill said. Bill, you mentioned that it's, it's, it's the rise of neoliberalism that is potentially the problem, that the wealth is at the top and neither party will sort of go at that and, and address it. Um, and you mentioned that the demise of unions is the reason why we have the, in part, the rise of neoliberalism. We probably have some economic things going on with deindustrialization as well. But Theta, you said that, because I thought that another rise of neoliberalism is related to the demise of the party system. You don't really need the Democratic or the Republican Party to run and win uh, because they don't have uh, as high as membership and they don't have that much, much money. And you can bypass them and go to Wall Street. And Bill, you mentioned this. So I was thinking that Theta, I mean, you Barack Obama probably wouldn't have made it out of Chicago if there money. was a strong Democratic Party because he wouldn't have gotten out of the out of the daily machine. I mean, he was able. It was amazing what it's he was able to It's not the kind of Democratic do. Party I'm talking about. Yeah, but no. And, and so, and Donald <laughs> Trump, Donald Trump wouldn't have won presidency if there was a strong Republican Party. That's true. But so, and I guess my question, this is for all the panelists, and, and then I think I get to part of Margaret's question is, if the Democratic Party gets stronger, will we tackle issues like Manuel talked about, equity, and will a stronger Democratic Party really lead to greater equity for low-income people across the country? It's the only thing that will, if it's the right kind of Democratic Party. Yeah, so um, I, I left out one, and thank you for the question about rural areas, uh, the transformations, and that was the total industrialization of our farm sector. So the state of North Carolina, as an example, which was really a state of small farmers because they all had their little plot of tobacco, um, made, it a, made it possible for the old line populist um, movement to combine labor and farm because small farmers face these same fights as labor uh, and and stood in relatively close enough position that that old line populist could could work and the New Deal was backboned by that ability to cross those bridges uh, that doesn't exist anymore because of the industrialization of farming and in North Carolina small farmers don't exist because we wiped out tobacco and so it, it it's just not as easy to to organize rural uh, communities in the same way with that same alignment, with that same belief that uh, the same forces were at play. And now American globalism and what we consider to be what we export is sort of like a third world country. We export industrialized agricultural products. So the way it used to be, uh, farmers could align with workers about being protected and that sort of thing. Now, this is not 
this is not the way it, it, it works. So that's, that, that's another one of those challenges that I think is missing. And, and I do totally agree that if saving the Democratic Party simply means a return to neoliberalism, it's not going to work. But what I see now is that the Democratic Party is really being pushed by people who um, are not, and, and I hate the way, this is what the press needs to stop doing from my perspective. Um, we, 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 we treat America when it was great uh, as, as, as on this trajectory and, and we forget the huge disconnect of this mad experiment of the last 50 years, 40 years or whatever. Um, America was on a logical progression we did the Fair Labor Standards Act. We knew we left out agricultural workers. We knew we left out domestic workers. It was not leftist, socialist, or whatever when in 1966 we said, oh, you know what? That was wrong. These people should have been included. We're going to include them. When it came to Social Security, same thing. We excluded those people. That was wrong. We should include them. We understood Social Security had a fault because of World War II. We had a lot of... of of soldiers return with disabilities. You need to have insurance for becoming disabled. Each of our projects became, we know we left somebody out in order to make the compromise to get forward, but we're gonna keep moving forward and we're gonna keep being more inclusive and we're gonna fix what we know we, we did as a compromise. If you understand that and you go, well, Johnson knew when he did Medicare and Medicaid, he was leaving people out. He knew that. It was, would you buy, politically, would you buy that at least if you're 65, I can give you health insurance? Would you buy that at least if you're a child, you ought to be insured? People who advocate today for closing the gap and saying, why don't all Americans get health insurance? They're not left or anything. They're on the continuum. They're filling the legacy. When in the beginning of the 20th century and we introduced zillions of new industries, all these techie people think they're you know, innovative. They're just like out to lunch. They're, they're so ahistorical. Between uh, 1870 and, and 1914, if you think about the things that got invented from airlines, motion pictures, radio, uh, automobiles and all the industries that get spurned by all of that stuff and the nation realized you can't do that on uh, eighth grade education. You're not going to have electricians. You're not going to have the people who can fix the cars. None of that's going to happen unless we have public K through 12 education. When people say we ought to have free college, my goodness, isn't that just a continuum? Sounds kind of Hegelian. Well, but I'm just saying, but I'm, but I'm, it may be Hegelian, but what I'm saying is when the press constantly says these are socialist ideas and these people are on the far left and the Democratic Party is being pulled to the left, I would say no, the, the, the American people have spoken. That experiment, that nightmare that we've been in, failed. The neoliberalism failed. We need to get back to what we know worked, and we need to continue our progress forward. What neoliberalism succeeded in doing is turning us from a country that believed that our collective democracy could move forward into a country that believed in austerity. And the cynicism of the Tea Party, the gov again, of the oligarchs. Government does nothing and should do nothing. And so I think the thing is to push people on, as they found out with the ACA, because their gut reaction from the condition in the last 40 years is you should hate this because the government is providing you health insurance. That was their gut reaction. But you know, when you push people, it's like, no, I kind of like the ACA. I like what it's doing. When, when you actually push Americans, they get back to, from my perspective, being Americans. What, when you go overseas, people think of us as a brash n nation. They think of us as the nation that always could do, would do, that doesn't know impossibilities. My, my grandmother's high school um, 
motto was, uh, impossible is un-American. And I think most of us, that's the country we grew up in. We grew up in, if it's possible to be done, provide health insurance, provide education, have a smart nation. That's what America is. This stuff, uh, Americans can't do that. It, that is un-American. That is off the, so I think what, what journalists have to do is to, is to start pressing people on that real sense of what do, what do you think America is? You know, when we say we hate immigrants, what, what are you hating? What, when, you, when you don't like something, what is, it, what is it at the core you really don't like? What is it you really think government should, really shouldn't do? But what is it you really want? And when you push them on what do you really want, oftentimes they really do want a solution. They don't like this, the, what economists have taught you is there's no solution. The robots are gonna take over your job, uh, globalism means that your job isn't going to be here anyway. There's nothing we can do about it, and all the money is going to go to rich people because that's the way it is. And if you're really talented and smart and get more education, then maybe you might get lucky and be one of those one percent. That's what we've told people. They have now rejected it, whether it's on the right or the left. Uh, the people on the right have rejected it because they uh, they uh, they have this cognitive dissonance, and and that's my. And when I was saying I was positive. It's the fact that these teachers could finally push people out of that cognitive dissonance. They hate the government, they hate what the government, they hate taxes, but here you know, in West Virginia and Kentucky and in Oklahoma and Arizona, they were able to galvanize people behind them in their movement against that austerity, against this sense of impossibility. And even though these are voters who profess that they hate the government and hate taxes, came to the realization there's a limit to this and the limit has been reached and we will rebel against it and we expect our state to respond by educating our children in a decent set of school buildings with people who are at least paid <laughs> and and that's a miracle when you think about how these uh, states and these counties otherwise vote that they actually unite it behind um, this mostly female-led teacher movement. It's not movement. going to be sustainable unless the Democratic Party of West Virginia becomes a real party. Do you know who runs West Virginia right now? The Koch Network runs West oh, Virginia. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they own the... And, uh, you know, uh, my sister lives in West Virginia. I spent a lot of time in West Virginia. Those folks are voting for Trump. They're very enthusiastic. Um, so I don't think even an outburst of, I mean, I'm with the person who asked, how is this sustainable? Uh, and if you got a better answer than a revitalized and remade Democratic Party, I'm all ears. Mm -hmm. But I don't see what it is. Um, I want to give Margaret a chance <laughs> to, to reply. I, I, you know, I'd I agree with everything that's been said. <laughs> uh, no, I have, I, I'll just make a, a few small uh, comments. Um, but. Um, you know, I think the thing that I would look for are unexpected, it, it links to what you're saying, but unexpected wins of expanding the public sector. And when you were talking, Bill, it, it, there's an old finding in public opinion that Americans are operational liberals and philosophical conservatives. Any, pr any program you ask them about, except foreign aid and welfare, they are in favor of, and they're in favor of spending money but when you ask them in the abstract about government. And so, I mean, I, I see as, uh, they don't like it, but I see as part of your bottom up idea is this pragma is tapping into that pragmatism where people want decent public schools for their kids, where, they're, where you're out of the I hate government. And so I am very attracted to this idea of a revitalized democratic party uh, in the sense of uh, having a local, con having being colonized locally by people from those areas, not just that the Democratic Party is young men from Brooklyn. Um, and so I think that 
a revitalized Democratic Party that could do tax and spend, I think um, it would make a difference for low-income people. And here's what, wh where I think it makes a difference is that when you have a larger pie, it's easier to strike bargains and to get power to, uh, to get a piece of it. If there's a really constrained public pie, you're more likely to have these zero-sum conflicts in which lower-income people will be the losers. So I think, um, uh, and you know, you see that across the U.S. as you know, urban aid declined and everything becomes more zero sum. All these public monies at the local level go into supporting gentrifying neighborhoods because they're the lifeblood of what's going to bring these cities back with with tax income. But if you have some largesse from above, at least you also have a public arena to contend for resources. Whereas if you privatize things. There's no public arena where you can even contend for the resources. So I don't. I, it's not automatic, but at least creates possibilities that aren't there otherwise. And I like. I just want to say about Royce uh, uh, Hansen's thing about um, parties and unions. And I, I think that's right. I would add religious organizations. I know they're declining, but I would add religious organizations to that. And I think where. Um, reformers have done best is when they have uh, parties, unions, and religious organizations kind of connected, which is kind of what all political machine, urban political machines did. Um, and so the question is, can you recreate these, those kinds of connections in some new form? Do these community labor alliances begin to build some more staying power so it isn't just the kind of morning glory and revitalize kind of more grassroots populated uh, parts of the Democratic Party. So that, that's what I would look for, some refashioning of those elements in this different uh, uh, kind of context. So, you know, you've raised the, the whole, the whole uh, history of, of democratic machine politics uh, a moment ago and the exchanges between <laughs> grassroots and, <laughs> and the parties. Uh, I think that uh, Clarence, who's, who's the specialist in regimes and urban regimes, wants to say something. Okay, so what I want to say is a reminder that the beginning of bottom up, in at least my thinking, was very much a rejection of top-down and its inadequacies. And so as someone who has spent many decades studying cities, I would say that three of the most disastrous things that have been inflicted on cities are redevelopment in the post-World War II period, the war on drugs, <coughs> Reagan, though it started with Nixon, but you know Reagan deserves the primary credit for that. And the third is neoliberal reform in education, which is still imposing its destructive impact on this country. And the additional thing that we need to be aware of is that top-down policies, and Phil, you touched on many of them, are also noted for what they don't cover, what they don't cover, what they don't lead people to go and knock on doors and ask, what are you concerned about? who don't go and say, I'm here to listen to you. I mean, these are the old community organizing tactics. So when I think about the present presidential contest, and I hear how many progressive Democrats have embraced Medicare for all, then I want to know to what extent do they even understand what Medicare for all, whatever it actually is, leaves out so very many people who will say, you know, we've been done in again. That's a great, you know, program, 
for people who don't currently have insurance but do actually have in their neighborhoods, you know, hospitals and medical facilities uh, and do not live in communities that are in the process of becoming medical care deserts. So, you know, are the Medicare for all sloganeers aware of what's actually happening at the local level? No, they're not. If so, I have not heard the reassurance that they actually know. So I think that there are continuing reasons to be concerned about top-down and how selective it will be. I, I don't want to talk about Medicare for all, but, um, but I do want to say something about the top-down policies and just the ones you talked about. I mean, I think the thing to highlight about what they do is that they destroy local institutions. And, you know, the school reform movement has led to uh, schools in low-income communities of color simply disappearing. Carolyn Adams had an interesting, uh, in her book about uh, Philadelphia, about how they all end up pulled out of the communities. This, um, obviously, the same thing has happened in Chicago. Uh, urban renewal destroyed local connections and networks that may, you know, that gave local capacity for bottom-up action. So I think it's worth highlighting the, the, the ways in which top-down can destroy the local capacity to action by destroying local networks and destroying local institutions, and instead thinking about what happens at higher levels that can enable local institutions and help build local capacity to act. I want to I mean, underline that. I actually think our language just fails us completely. I don't think top down versus bottom up is helpful. I think the question should be, how do things that happen at higher levels either enable the right networks, encourage the right kind of organization and participation, or discourage them? And, you know, some top down policies do encourage and enable, others do not. And we need to think about politics in terms of relationships. And journalists need to think about politics in terms of relationships. Instead of the heroic qualities of individual people, or even the demographic features that statistical types count up. Um, you know, it's all relational. It's all networks. And conservatives today understand that. They're not just throwing money around. They're always setting out to destroy the organizations and the networks through which liberal center-left politics happens and citizen engagement happens, and they are building up their own alternative networks, such as the National Rifle Association, which does have local roots, such as church networks in the evangelical right. They're not the only church networks. There are liberal church networks, too, which we ought not to just dismiss. Um, the Fraternal Order of Police. I have a student who looked at Fraternal Order of Police lodges around the country and showed that statistically they generated support for Donald Trump above and beyond the normal uh, Republican coalition. And that's because Donald Trump understood that the Black Lives Matter movement was interpreted as a threat by white police officers and their families and their friends. And so he, you never see Donald Trump appear before a natural group unless it's evangelical Christians or a police union. And then he's there because he, somebody around him, I don't think he knows, but somebody around him knows. It's all networks, and you have to activate the right ones. So we should be asking that about the policies we support. So a couple of th thoughts, if I might, and then, Please. which, um, so first, Donald Trump just gave a Fidel-style two-hour speech, uh, <laughs> which is about as clear a sign of movement autocracy as you no, can imagine. No, Fidel gave long speeches. This was incoherent. 
Not yes. the people who heard it. it was. But I want to, Clarence, as, as usual, has provoked, exactly. provoked something very important, but I want to lift up one thread in it, which is that one thread that connects redevelopment, the war on drugs, and the neoliberal uh, reform in education is that they were racial projects. Uh, they were about eliminating the voice of a set of communities and replacing with an alternative vision of what was supposed to be done. Sort of taking apart African American, immigrant, Latino neighborhoods with redevelopment and reconceptualizing them as new downtowns. The war on drugs was clearly racially targeted, uh, both in its imagery and its uh, facts. And neoliberal reform, for all of the reasons that uh, Margaret is pointing out, is a racial project as well. And part of the reason why I lift that up is part of the California story that we tell, again, in more detail in the book, is that what, you know, things really worked in California in the 1950s. There was this kind of broad sense of investment in uh, infrastructure, expanding of housing, investment in human capital. And if you want to ask kind of what went wrong in California, racism got the better of us. Uh, Ronald Reagan ran for governor based on the fact that he supported a proposition that sought to reinstitute racial discrimination in housing uh, because that it, uh, it had been uh, racial segregation in housing had been eliminated by a, a California State Legislative Act in 1963. Proposition in 1964 sought to put racial segregation back into housing. Ronald Reagan won, ran for that, argued for that based on property rights. He won two years later. 1978, the passage of Prop 13 looked at as mostly an attack on the state. Uh, fiscal uh, coffers, which it was, uh, was really a declaration of generational warfare because it occurred in the single decade, the 1970s, in which the share of children who were children of color rose at a faster pace than at any other time in California history before or since. And it was put into being by the same folks who'd resisted busing to try to integrate the schools. And it wound up freezing the tax assessments and therefore tax payments of an older, less diverse uh, home ownership group just as new, young, younger, more diverse homeowners were arriving and paying full freight and as newer, younger, uh, uh, more diverse generation needed the kind of public investments that had been crucial. The reason why I raised that is because I think in California what people have figured out how to do, and I think we need to figure out how to do it at a national level, is how to talk about race and racism and center racial equity in a way that talks about how that can actually improve everybody's outcomes uh, without it making a kind of scary, uh, we can't talk about this uh, kind of discussion. It is fascinating to me with the little bit of time that I spent with the sort of suburban white women who've been part of the resistance movement, how much they actually want to talk about race. Oh, yeah, they do. They, they all do. They feel like they don't know that much about it, but they realize that it's what kind of derailed things nationally, and we realize it's kind of what derailed things in terms of our state, so they're really eager to have the conversation. Uh, so I think unless we kind of talk very honestly about the role that race and racism play in those kind of policies, uh, we wind up coming up short in terms of the kind of discussions we need to provoke about it. And I felt very uh, animated by the way that Clarence brought up those three really key policies, which I think really point to, to some of the things you're talking about and also point to the underlying dynamics of race. Yeah, Manuel raised the points that I'm not gonna raise. I'm gonna talk directly about the healthcare issue because again, this is another one of those policies we made without having the discussion. We have not paid attention to transforming our hospital industry into such a profit-driven industry and the concentration of hospital power. And at the local level, we haven't seen the response. Take DC as an, as an example, where a Fortune 500 company runs the hospital for George Washington University, wanted to expand into Southeast Washington increasing the concentration of this Fortune 500 company at the face of us shutting down Providence Hospital. Uh, this is an example of where at the local level you would have thought that local leaders would have said, wait, hospital concentration is really bad. It increases monopsony power 
And from the workers' perspective, not just from the healthcare perspective, but from the workers' perspective, this is bad for wages in the healthcare industry to have such monopsony power. It's bad for healthcare to give grants such monopsony power, and it's part of the reason why our healthcare system is more expensive and inefficient because we have these competing mo- m- monopolies uh, in healthcare, and and it creates the deserts where you can't make profits. And so the people of Kentucky and and rural areas who can only make those hospitals work through Medicaid end up having to accept formulas that make those hospitals not profitable or sustainable. And so this transformation has been so extreme and so complete that we have quietly walked into this reality and it's not discussed. So I think you hit it right that, yes, there's the insurance side, but we've totally ignored the delivery side of health care. And doctors are no longer doctors. They are employees. <laughs> uh, there's a 1% who run the major doctor groups, and they are, they are literally part of the 1%. Um, yeah, we get a, we get so, no benefits out of the concentration of healthcare. You know, yeah, this and is so what's th- happening. This, this is another yeah. one of those examples where where neoliberalism right. has played away. I I, I just want to conclude by saying that the, the the what makes this all more difficult because of neoliberalism is our acceptance of such an extreme inequality. So programs which were designed for the poor because we understood that in a market system where you're um, allowing the market to um, allocate goods, we know that your pricing, you're using pricing to ration. The market rations. It just does it by price. And you know you are pricing people at the bottom out. And the piece of the previous liberal was that we would uh, accommodate poor people. But because of the high level of inequality, health care, housing, education are all out of the reach of middle America and growing. And so the problem is these programs are no longer, the, the zero-sum <laughs> game is these programs are no longer big enough to subsidize the number of people who are being priced out because the, the, the priced out point keeps moving up the income distribution. And because now the majority of Americans are being priced out, um, there's a resentment that well, we used we to have, you used to have very big risk pools, which uh, <laughs> spread out some of that cost. Somebody define um, neoliberalism for me in a simple way that helps a naive political scientist understand this oh no. gigantic <laughs> concept a little better. I, I think in terms of concrete actors and organizations, and I don't who who is neoliberalism as an organization. I'm serious. I want to know what you're talking about. It it, it is a belief and letting market forces dominate life. So it is a belief that economic power does not exist and institutions don't matter, uh, that markets are supreme, and the compromise constantly that liberals made was to, and the third way was constantly, how can we put more in the market? Because there was a belief that markets are efficient. That sounds like the Coke Network's beliefs to me. Okay, but that's yeah. secret. And I studied okay, that. Yeah, okay, yeah. but but this this is this is what the Democratic Party constantly compromised on: more and more and more would be in the marketplace, and we would deregulate under Jimmy Carter. We would deregulate that's the airline industry. Yeah, that's yes, about. you're it's talking deregulation. about deregulation. Well, it's, it's more it's, it's more than it's, 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 it's more than deregulation, but deregulation is part of that. Belief and deregulation also means de- de- deregulate the the labor market because unions are, you know, part of the. And problem. when was this moment when Americans were taking care of the poor adequately? <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 it's not that we did it adequately. It wasn't that we did it adequately. It was an understanding that it was o- okay to talk about programs that try to address people priced out of the market, and. And we do have programs that we still attempt. Have huge ones. Yeah. Well, we still and we still have programs that attempt to do that. What I'm saying is that those programs are increasingly inadequate because the number of people being priced out is going up. It's not just the people at the bottom 20 percent anymore who are being priced out. And the cutoffs, and we're fighting this now with minimum, raising the minimum wage, 
people are saying, well, you can't raise the minimum wage because then people reach these cliffs. They won't be able to get SNAP benefits in certain states. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to have access to child care subsidies in certain states because they, they have very hard lines in some states only for people in the bottom 20%. But we know that child care is outstripping more than the bottom 20%. We know that food inadequacy is outstripping more than. Yes, we know yes, that yes. housing, and we know that all these things, the, the people being priced out in these programs aren't yes. adequate and aren't big enough because of that. And housing was never big enough. We, our, our, our attempt to help people in housing uh, ha has never been big enough. So, all right, so we have a terrible welfare state and we have everything's means tested except for social security and, and, and we have private, you know, we have private provision that eats away at the people who can afford to pay into these pools, insurance pools. So uh, this is not a happy, uh, a, a nice scene uh, in terms of social policy at the moment. But um, I want to give the uh, opportunity to do one more round. We have very little time, and I know that there are more questions in the audience. Can we do one more round, please? Would that be okay? But Quickly. you have to do do your question. Mm -hmm. They have to be questions really fast, okay? So we want to get you involved, please. Um, again, yeah, well, we went on very long. So, yeah, so who has the microphone? And, yeah, I, I would like to take advantage to hear another round. So, please. Yeah. Short. Yeah, thank Short. you. Yes, yes. Short. Uh, my name is Mindy Reiser. I've worked internationally and involved in peace building and conflict resolution with an NGO and so on and so forth. We haven't talked much about the link between local initiatives and international ones. In the labor movement, there have been interesting arrangements with, say, German companies wanting to come sometimes to southern states, international arrangements, which, which have some benefits. Some companies in some countries do well with their workers. So I'd like to hear a little bit about this international back and forth at the hyper-local level and with the encouragement and engagement of the states. There are some things to be learned there. Maybe some of you have learned them. Very nice. Hi, my name is Salah Hiza. I'm a AAAS fellow at USD NIFA. My question is, wouldn't you say that the culmination of bottom-up politics, isn't it, the presidency of Trump? Like, you look at the policies of that Trump's doing. From one aspect, it is really more of a bottom-up approach. Yep, we have a lot of populism at the moment. Um, there are two more, two more hands, at least. Thanks, Ben Homer. I'm a researcher focused on uh, media technology and political change. Uh, and I'm interested in sort of one thing you haven't talked about is the youth and where youth are getting engaged. It sounds like uh, there's a lot of engagement with uh, older demographic. Uh, and I wonder if you drew any connections between other movements that did engage youth, such as uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, certainly youth were very engaged in Barack Obama's election to some extent in Trump's election. So I'm curious. Excellent question. Hi, my name is Beth Offenbecker. My research is in public engagement and uh, uh, on an international level, uh, but I also have an intense interest right now in citizen science as an entree point um, to local decision making. My question is about oligarchies. And I, one of the things I'm struck by is some of the themes across the conversation and the topic of race and some systemic bias and structures that keep people out of um, enacting their power uh, on a local level. And so I was appreciative of the, the examples from California. Um, what I'm wondering is uh, insights of any of, the, any of the strategies that have been talked about, the translocalism and what have you, uh, do not seem to have eaten away at the oligarchies that exist, especially in southern states when we think about um, keeping um, citizens out of power. And so I'm interested in any um, other perspectives that you might have from other countries to the international question, and um, really why has this problem persisted? So, and I think Greg has one last question. I think there's one last Oh, there's question. one back there? Okay, please. Hi, my name is Rita Jalali, and I'm a sociologist. I had two questions. One is, I think maybe we haven't talked about the role of money in the sense of campaign finance reform. Okay. And I was thinking more of Elizabeth Warren's initiative to try and uh, say that she's not going to accept 
um, large donor money, and I think she said that she won't have any fundraising mm -hmm. events. And um, you know, uh, I'm part of a very small grassroots group that I'll maybe later have opportunity to talk to Theta Scotchpool about it. But what we found is that what the way we have gotten involved in local politics as well as politics uh, across uh, Virginia and Maryland is sort of donating to all these candidates, $15, $50, all of that. And then we found that local legislators do come and want to talk to our groups because we've done these small fundraising events where we raise 1500 2000 So uh, by removing the connection between large donors and our um, legislators, would that help in connecting the communities to um, you know, um, politics at the uh, state and national level? The other question that I had was also if we say that the Tea Party movement uh, grew out of um, anger because they, you know, Obama was elected as a black candidate, and similarly for the resistance grew out of the anti-Trump feelings. Uh, I mean, is there a danger when, say, in 2020, we are lucky, we have a, a Senate majority, a Democratic majority in the Senate, and in the House too, and we have a Democratic president, <laughs> then all that energy. Uh, you know, I can see some of that energy losing out in my own group because we are also revved up and involved at lev different levels. But would that then also lead to a decline in all that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, that, that uh, it's an issue that also engages, engages me. I mean, it, what is the difference between a social movement organization and the kinds of coalitions and federations, the institutionalization of these uh, groups? Um, that, uh, you know, th there's a, a line. Some of them are, are locally, they have staying power, they're sustainable, whereas movements tend to, tend to demobilize, as you point out. Um, I think, Greg, no, you don't have a last question? Okay, so we'll do one more round, two minute, one of those two minute things of wrap up. Um, Bottom up politics, <laughs> throw it away. Uh, is it is it still valuable to is is localism the new localism a flash in the pan? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm planning to answer the question. Yeah, sorry. I think right. I can. I think I can thread in your question and the others. Uh, so, first, with regard to uh, the question about Trump, I think there's a difference between uh, bottoms up and being a bottom feeder. Um, and uh, <laughs> what we saw was a kind of politics that played to the basest instincts and uh, whips up fervor in a way that can win an election, but it's pretty hard to sustain any kind of actual governance, and we're sort of seeing that right now. So I think the people who've been trying to do uh, bottoms up uh, do think about it more seriously, not just solving local problems through local means, but how can they connect to the kind of networks? How can they scale up and change things? Uh, second, with regard to uh, youth engagement, uh, yes, this is probably not the right age panel to talk about that, uh, but that's a very uh, important thing. And I would say it's, uh, you know, the example that got lifted up, I think Occupy really wasn't a movement, but a moment. Uh, it did stir kind of a conversation, but it was hard to figure out what was going to come as an agenda from that. But if you look at the way that dreamers change the debate um, around immigration in the country, if you look at the way in which Black Lives Matter, which has been largely youth, uh, had a younger element, kind of uh, millennials uh, in terms of its leadership uh, and moving things forward, they've had a really significant uh, impact on, on changing things. And uh, young folks are much more likely for all sorts of reasons to think more intersectionally than older organizers who have been more used to organizing in silos of race or labor or particular kinds of communities. They're much more intersectional. I find kind of great hope there. And then finally with the, the question which was kind of like what happens if we win, uh, will we get kind of tired out? Uh, I don't think so. The California example is that we've been winning for a while and yet there's a whole bunch of other stuff to do. But that only happens if what you think is it's not about winning political power and the levers of government. It's about building strong social movements and community-based organizations that can hold government accountable. 
If you think it's that, then there's no end to the organizing. So you don't get tired out if you get a Democratic senator or a Democratic congressperson. You know, in Orange County, uh, again, uh, it turned uh, blue for the uh, first time since anybody can remember. And I was at a gathering of a lot of the people who helped do that, that organizing, which was a lot of, uh, uh, it's more mixed in California, but a lot of, you know, kind of white suburban uh, presence. And addressing the group was uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who reminded people that, uh, yes, we won, but we're just renting these offices. We don't own them yet. Uh, and that it's going to take several terms of winning to actually own uh, those political, that political terrain. So I think if you, uh, the way people have thought about mobilizing the vote is like we're going to get out at the time of the vote, get people to vote, and never, never talk to them again. Integrated voter engagement is about continuing the community organizing and actually making sustained change is how does this set of movements that Theta is talking about really wind up continually going back to that well over and over again and uh, animating people's spirit about really achieving democracy and equity in the United States. Great. Theta? Well, let me uh, uh, leap in on, uh, in that spirit with a few of the questions. The question about Occupy Wall Street and Obama. I think that people should look uh, very critically at what did not happen after the remarkable uh, Obama organizing that built on the Dean model in 2008 and narrowed down quite a bit in 2012. Um, that is actually part of a long-term tendency of Democratic presidents to fail to transfer their campaign organizations into building broader movements and parties. And uh, that was a terrible failure from a president that was, who was otherwise, a, in my opinion, a wonderful uh, president. Um, Occupy Wall Street and to some degree Black Lives Matter have not engaged the electoral arena enough. It's not a question of selling out or being absorbed into the electoral arena, but finding a way to leverage the electoral arena uh, to elect people and eventually be able to use government um, authority, I'm going to use that word, to create policies that both deliver benefits to people, hopefully all Americans, and build the networks and organizations that sustain the movements. That's called policy feedback. That's a type of thinking that needs to be incorporated into any democratic victory or center-left victory in government. Not should it be Medicare for all or M Medicare for more, but which of these and how are they designed will actually enable politically active citizens and networks to build their power over time while the, while the benefits are being delivered. And the Affordable Care Act could have been used that way. It has not been very much. So that's part of the answer to what happens with electoral success. I think the Democrats are at a very delicate moment right now. They've taken the House of Representatives, which is enough to pass some bills, enough to hold some hearings. It's not enough to deliver actual payoffs to large numbers of Americans and convince them that government can actually be on their side. So uh, it's a three election process. There's gotta be a president and there's gotta be the Senate. I don't believe the Senate can go over before 2022 and the House has got to be held in this whole period. And then the Democrats have to do the right things with the power that they have. So, but they have to think of it as building a synergy with organized um, movements and citizens groups, and not just the ones I'm talking about, but, but unions where they are powerful, black churches, they were key in Alabama. You know, they're, they're, you find these in different places and you enable them. So that's part of the answer, and I guess I'll just say one more thing. Um, is Trump a bottom-up phenomenon? My other research is on the Republican Party, and I think we ought to think more about the Republican Party and less about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is... Aberration. He's a symptom, yeah. and he's a symptom of something that can become more virulent and effective. I'll give you the name Tom Cotton. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. He's a Harvard-trained fascist. <laughs> <laughs> but he is. And, you know, they're, the forces that lay behind this are, par are middle class for the most part and white and older. Um, some of them are workers, blue collar workers who, whose unions are gone or whose industries are gone. But, but they yearn for a return to order that has been lost in many of their communities. We haven't talked about the opiate epidemic, but it has created a sense of disconnection and despair and effectiveness in a lot of places. That's what Donald Trump plays on as well as the racial resentments and the racial fears and the generational fears. Those fears are gonna be there for a while. The fuel that brought Donald Trump to the presidency is still going to be there. And because the Republican Party has capitulated to that, there's it allowed itself to become a vehicle of that. And it's one of two major political parties in this country the danger is going to remain for the next 10 to 15 years. So nobody should think that when the Donald is gone, what he's a symptom of will be gone. Okay, on that happy note, Bill. <laughs> well, I, I would agree because uh, Trump was inevitable. The, the Republican Party had backed itself into a corner. Their policies could not deliver for the people they quote unquote were seeking votes from, and they were left with the only thing that the oligarchs of the South could rely on, which is to be fascist. So this is what they devolved to. It, it is the only thing left of their party. The, 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 the Republicans were revulsed by, or, or repulsed by this, uh, or haven't had the, 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 the guts to reclaim their party or stand up to it. And in part because they can't, because this is this is where they chase their own party. Um, we have they found they choose not to go. Well, they that. choose not to because this. Yes, I I Her totally business agree. And they like the cuts in the taxes mm -hmm. and the cuts on the regulation. Well, as long as they got their business tax cut, they were happy and they were willing to use this vehicle to get it. But I think they I think as you point out, this is an existential threat to democracy. Having a party like that and a key thing you pointed out, which was very important for Democrats to learn, is he has empowered that base and given legitimacy to that voice. So now it is part of the debate. We have ugly debates because he's he, the media has validated that this has to be on the table because the president's party and the president says this sort of stuff. So now we consider that as this is one side of the story. Um, Unions have had a very hard time with transplants. Sometimes our allies overseas have been able to get the employer to take a neutral stance. Um, when it comes to organizing, often they don't, um, and they have chosen repeatedly to locate in the South. Um, it is a global movement against the labor movement. Union density is declining everywhere in the world. Germany's union density is declining uh, quite dramatically and fearfully because that is what is helping to fuel the resurgence of Nazism in, in Germany. Um, so this is a disturbing trend and it's part of the rise of the right has been this global attack on union and union power and it's fueled and it's helped by the fact that most of these global corporations choose to be in the South, where even when in the case of Volkswagen we won neutrality, the state party intervened. <laughs> the governor intervened on the side of no, no union, even though the, the company took a publicly neutral stance and didn't do its typical non-union stuff. I think young people in the Black Lives Matter have transformed expectations in the black community. They have had great victories in local politics. You look at Ferguson and the transformation of the city council. You look at wow. the victories of uh, black state uh, attorneys in Chicago, upsets of you know who people thought was gonna win. Baltimore City was a huge upset. St. Louis was a huge upset. These um, prosecutors who didn't do what the black community thought should have happened in these cases were all driven by 
of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think this is where the, the Democratic Party is being forced to change the way it talks about race and, and expectations of what racial equity would mean going forward and how we can ad- have conversations to address these, these deeper divides. What I remind people of, in order to exclude the 75% of black people who were agricultural workers and domestics, um, blacks still were only 25% of agricultural workers and domestics, which meant that millions of white people had to be sacrificed in order to get at those black workers. And this is repeated throughout when you look at these racialized policies. Only when, I always found this amazing, we were quite satisfied with American schools and what they produced. Only when the majority of students started to be black and when the superintendent started to be black and the city council started to be black did it suddenly become, you know what? We don't know if you finish high school if that's enough. We need evidence that this means something. All of a sudden, this became a topic of debate as to what was a high school diploma because the wrong people are in charge. (laughs) And we can't hand you the key. We can't trust you with the key. So we have to take the key away from you. This this generated the whole neoliberal revolt against what was K through 12 education. Suddenly, all of a sudden in American history, K through 12 was no longer a a valuable measure of anything. Um, And so... And so people, people understanding the racial lens by which we attack these things, I think, uh, is, is, is helpful. Um, and, and I think that's what people are calling for, is a reexamination of the basic tenets of, of how we've operated. Thank you. Margaret? <laughs> Thank you, Hillary. I know you're always down uh, there. I guess I, I'll just say two uh, things that maybe are a little more uh, on the hopeful side. And uh, I said this because I'm following you. Um, uh, I I never do this. But um, I mean, one is, you know, we've had this debate some about, you know, that America's changing demographically and what does that mean? And people say, well, you know, demographics is not destiny, which I agree with. But I have been impressed in this metro level stuff that I'm doing that the changes uh, in terms of uh, large numbers of immigrants, uh, people who are just less anti-government and more open to the idea that government can help solve problems. So that politics in Houston, the politics in the Atlanta area are very different from what they were 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And and, and I think we are going to continue to see changes in the economically prosperous parts of the Sun Belt. I I don't think the oligarchy will be able to hold on there. And the other sort of positive thing is that this is, I think we're in a period right now of kind of organizational and movement, um, I don't know, experimentation, right? When we were talking about youth, I thought about the Parkland youth too in terms of the anti uh, gun movement. And so there's a lot of things that are kind of emerging. And the question I think will be is how do they get, and this kind of repeats the this thing, but how do they get, what do they get networked to? Um, do they get networked to something? Do, do they understand the importance of that? I had a former student who was active in Occupy, and I knew somebody in the Working Families Party who tried to connect with them and said, you know, they don't, they don't want to, they don't want to have, you know, they're against being uh, connected, um, but you know, figuring out what are the what are some of these things because there's so many of them kind of emerging, and how will they end up? Which of them will end up lasting, and how will they be connected? And I, I, to me, it's kind of a fascinating thing because there is so much ferment out there that of people who don't want just to sit in and might might do whatever they did in in uh, Occupy. So I I think it's a moment of great possibility. On that note, we have some great possibilities outside. Uh, with uh, we, We've uh, planned a reception for you. Uh, hopefully, I, mean, I would look forward to um, pursuing some of the international aspects of bottom-up uh, during the reception uh, outside. Um, 
I, I want to thank everybody for a really thoughtful conversation and really a discussion. The back and forth was terrific, and you've given us so much to think about. Um, we'll, we'll be back next year, I hope. <laughs> I don't know. It looks like we've learned a great deal, and um, yeah, uh, the, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. For your